Putin is terrified of F-16s in Ukraine, and he should be. Since basically the beginning of the Russian invasion, Ukraine has been pleading with its Western supporters for advanced fighter jets. For most of the war, the US has been staunchly opposed to giving Ukraine these systems, as they could allow for strikes far behind Russian lines, escalating the conflict. But now, officials in Kyiv might be finally getting their wish, in the form of US-made F-16s set to be delivered later this year. As of this video, the training for Ukrainian F-16 pilots has begun in Denmark, and is set to begin in multiple other NATO countries such as the Netherlands. Back at the annual G7 summit in May, with Ukraine's Zelensky as a special guest, US President Joe Biden announced that the US would conduct its own training for Ukrainian F-16 pilots, which it estimated could be completed in under a year, with basic training possibly taking only four months. But where might all these jets be coming from? How important are they to Ukraine? And perhaps most importantly, how could they change the outcome of this brutal and unpredictable war? Let's start with the question of where exactly the F-16s might be coming from. There are more than 2,200 F-16s around the world, making it the most popular combat aircraft in use today. But the most likely candidates seem to be jets recently retired by the Netherlands, Denmark and Norway. These would likely be the F-16 AMBM models, which were originally acquired in the 1980s and upgraded in the 1990s. All of these would therefore be aging aircraft with high mileage and old radar systems. But even with these drawbacks, the jet software allows them to use some of the most modern and deadly weapons in the NATO arsenal, including the AIM-120 air-to-air missiles and stealthy long-range joint air-to-surface standoff missiles, or JASMs. Reports suggest that the Netherlands in particular was closely involved in the effort to get Washington to approve the F-16 training, helping convince Biden of their need in Ukraine. Interestingly, however, the F-16s aren't coming from the US at all. This is probably partially due to the tensions with China, for which the Pentagon is keeping significant material in reserve in case an air or naval battle breaks out over the Taiwan Strait or South China Sea. The other main reason is that US policymakers still worry that too aggressive or successful a strike by Ukraine could force Putin's hand in ways we'd all rather not think about. That was the rationale behind the strategy so far. Give Ukraine as many surface-to-air and land capabilities as possible while avoiding the potential of an aerial strike inside Russian territory. But this logic has already been challenged by Ukraine's use of drones in so-called shaping operations in recent weeks, some of which have reached as far as Moscow. Because of this, the authorization for Ukraine to receive F-16s and the associated training has been a matter of tension in Washington for months. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and several others have objected to the idea, essentially claiming that there were too many unknowns and that Ukraine has done well enough without F-16s. So the approval for other countries to ship their F-16s to Ukraine is still a big change, overriding a key condition baked into their initial sale by the US, which prohibited European allies from sending them elsewhere. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was apparently one of the driving forces behind the administration's decision, as well as helping to convince European NATO allies to get on board. Yet even so, it's unclear when any of these countries will actually be supplying the F-16s in question. The Netherlands, Belgium and Denmark are working towards replacing their current F-16s with more advanced F-35s, but have all held back on actually committing to sending the old jets to Ukraine. Similarly, the UK has offered to provide flight training, but doesn't actually operate any F-16s itself. While this may start to change once the training is complete, there's currently a lot of hesitation from the West about pushing Putin just a little too far and ending up in some sort of nuclear standoff. Some countries like Belgium also worry about diminishing their own capabilities. Not that Belgium is a likely candidate to be invaded by anyone. Others, like Denmark, have stated that they will reconsider sending F-16s if others are also doing so, but that they won't go it alone. The Netherlands and Norway appear to be similarly torn, while other countries with F-16s not in the process of being phased out are much less likely to join in. In a nutshell, at the moment it's pretty clear that even those countries which have declared support for Ukraine's push for jets either can't or aren't willing to provide significant numbers of them in the short to medium term. Once Ukraine actually gets the aircraft, there's another set of problems it needs to deal with. Specifically, they must be able to operate, maintain and sustain the F-16s, which is not the easiest task. For instance, a March 2023 study by the Congressional Research Service identified several crucial conditions necessary to successfully field the jets. The biggest concerns it identified concern the supply chain. 
This means acquiring sufficient spare parts, allocating funding for operations and support, implementing a maintenance inventory system, training maintainers, and acquiring an ongoing supply of weapons with which to arm their F-16s. These tasks are difficult enough for countries in peacetime, with previous experience and a wide base of technical knowledge. For Ukraine, they are likely to be even trickier. Of course, if the course of the war so far is anything to judge by, Ukrainians will continue to figure out inventive solutions to logistical issues facing their military. Russians, on the other hand, have no hope of obtaining advanced fighter jets and are stuck using obsolete human wave tactics while trying to avoid kicking off a civil war in their own country. But even accounting for the staggering incompetence of the Russian military, Ukraine certainly still faces some hurdles obtaining and operating even used F-16s. If they take to the skies without plans to support these aircraft, they will break down quickly and most likely become expensive stationary targets for Russian air-to-surface missiles. This is especially true for the F-16, which can require some 18 hours of maintenance for every hour of flight time. Basically, if they do things right and don't rush it, there's a strong possibility that Ukraine won't even be using the F-16s until the end of 2023. This also suggests that many defense experts believe the war will continue for quite some time, despite the incompetence of the Russian armed forces and short mutiny of the Wagner Group PMC. By greenlighting the transfer of the F-16s, the US is essentially admitting that the war will not stop anytime soon, and that Ukraine will need continual upgrades to its firepower in a long-term war of attrition. If Ukraine can get a handle on the jet's supply and maintenance, that's when the training will really start to become important. Like any complex weapon system, the F-16 was designed to fill a particular set of roles in an existing military structure and support certain doctrines of modern warfare. To get the most out of them, the Ukrainians will need to adopt more of the practices and techniques which the plane's design caters to. Fundamentally, the F-16 was designed to help the US Air Force beat the Russian Air Force in aerial combat. Logic follows that the more the Ukrainians can fly them like the US Air Force would, the better the results will be. Of course, other NATO countries have adopted similar practices, but most of these are also quite different from the ways Ukraine has been fielding their existing fighter jets. For one thing, the F-16 was essentially designed to be a lightweight, multi-role fighter capable of doing many different missions well, but not to be the best at any of them. F-16s were definitely not intended to be operated from improvised airfields as Ukraine has been doing with many of its current aircraft. They can be especially susceptible to getting debris caught in their engines, a great way to crash before ever engaging in combat. This brings up the issue of where Ukraine would put the 200 F-16s it's asking for. RAND Corporation analysts John Hone and William Courtney recently assessed that F-16s do best on long, pristine runways. They could face difficulties on the rougher, former Soviet ones dispersed across Ukraine. To bring in Western aircraft, Ukraine might need to repave and potentially extend a number of runways, a process which Russia would likely detect. If only a few airfields were suitable and in known locations, focused Russian attacks could impede Ukrainian F-16s from flying. This is mostly because idiotic and unprepared as most of Russia's military might be, they still have access to some pretty advanced technology. This is especially true when it comes to air-to-air -to -air combat. Modern Russian air fighters such as the MiG-31 and Su-35 can see quite far with their powerful modern radars. They also have R-37 missiles that have a longer range than NATO-supplied AIM-120 AMRAMs or advanced medium-range air-to-air missiles. In other words, Russian aircraft can potentially spot Ukrainian F-16s and shoot them down before the Ukrainian pilots see them coming. Some of this has already happened with Ukraine's current fleet of Su-27 and MiG-29 fighters, and the improved capabilities of the F-16 are not enough to change this dynamic. Because of the reach of these Russian fighters, Ukrainian fighter pilots often break off missions early or operate far behind their own front lines. F-16s would operate with the same constraints, limiting their ability to perform air-to-surface missions with relatively short-range weapons like the JDAM bomb guidance kits. Because of this, even once Ukraine receives F-16s, it will still most likely have to rely on drones and other current air platforms for support. There's also the question of how to get the proper armaments Ukraine needs to pair with the F-16s. The best way for Ukraine to capitalize on any F-16s it receives will be advanced Western armaments which can stand up to Russian firepower. The issue? Like everything else in a war, these can be staggeringly expensive. For instance, a single AMRAM costs about $1.2 million, while it takes about two years to make one. The US could always provide existing weapons like the AMRAM from its own stockpiles, 
but that could leave them depleted in the event of an unexpected conflict, a risk the Pentagon is not willing to take. However, the real tactical and logistical advantages that F-16s would provide to Ukraine are long-term. A major benefit is that it will be easier for Ukraine to maintain aircraft whose parts are supplied by the United States and NATO than their current, outdated aircraft manufactured by Russia. In turn, this could also make it easier for Ukraine to integrate their air force into NATO sometime in the future, and the more Ukraine's arsenal is compatible with NATO's, the better they'll fare, and the worse off Putin will find himself. For instance, Ukraine was previously given AGM-88 high-speed anti-radiation missiles HARM, to use against ground-based radar systems. As with much of their current military arsenal, they managed to attach the system onto their MiG-29s, but the end result was far from ideal, since Soviet-era fighters were not designed to fire US-manufactured missiles. F-16s with modern software will enable Ukraine to employ harms and other modern weapon systems much more effectively. This includes missiles such as the AIM-9 Sidewinder and the AIM-120, which the United States and NATO are likely to provide, will be useful for Ukraine's defense against Russian cruise missiles like the KH-101 and the KH-555 and against Iranian-made Shahed Kamikaze drones. Ukraine's stockpiles of Soviet S-300 surface-to-air missiles are running out pretty quickly, and there are only so many Patriot missiles available. So even if Russia will still have some superior jets, the F-16's air-to-air capability will definitely help those ground-based defenses last longer, and it's pretty clear that this is necessary. Western military analysts have estimated that Ukraine's combined fleet belonging to air and ground forces has been depleted by more than a third since the Russian invasion began. Ukraine has lost at least 60 of its 145 fixed-wing planes and 32 of 139 helicopters, according to classified US military information leaked on the social media platform Discord in recent months. The Ukrainian Air Force rarely reveals numbers regarding its fleet or other details of tactical importance, including incidents of planes shot down or otherwise destroyed, but officials have acknowledged losses from the more than a year of war as well as difficulties with the repair and replacement of damaged planes. Another big question is whether the United States will supply powerful JASMs to use with the F-16s. These deadly, low-detection cruise missiles are incredibly long-range and have a 1,000-pound armor-piercing warhead. It also seems there's a good chance of this happening. Britain has provided the Storm Shadow air-launched cruise missiles, and Ukraine has already put them to use. Storm Shadow is generally similar to the baseline version of JASM in terms of size, range, employment, and observability, so providing JASMs would not necessarily be an escalation. F-16s utilizing JASMs could allow for Ukrainian Defense Minister Alexei Reznikov's stated long-term plan to retake Crimea without a fight. Carrying out such a plan would require cutting off Russian troops in Crimea from their supply lines via the Kerch Strait Bridge ports like Sevastopol and the land route from the Russian city of Rostov-on-Don. JASMs could give Ukraine the ability to fire on and destroy logistic hubs like naval bases, ammunition depots, bridges, and command and control facilities deep within Crimea. It could also serve as an alternative to the surface-to-air ATAC-M's missile, which Ukraine has requested but not yet received. The United States has quite a few more JASMs than ATAC-M's, so it might be willing to supply them to augment Ukraine's current arsenal of storm shadows. Another area F-16s could be helpful to Ukraine is as a good old-fashioned deterrent. While Putin clearly has no desire for the war to end, he was recently forced to replace General Sergei Sorovkin due to his involvement in the Wagner Group's attempted coup against Putin himself. Sorovkin was widely known as one of Russia's most trigger-happy commanders, willing to launch indiscriminate attacks against the civilian population of Ukraine but whoever he gets replaced with may be less gung-ho about ordering air and drone strikes on Kyiv, especially if Ukraine has 200 F-16s with which to respond. While there's little chance that Russian attacks will stop in the east, Ukraine having advanced fighter jets may give it enough of an edge in the air that attacks in the west of the country are diminished. The fact that Ukrainian jets and helicopters have been forced to attack cautiously for the entire war means that F-16s and their longer-range weaponry could prove very useful here. Ukrainian pilots have developed a tactic of flying low, unleashing unguided rockets from Ukrainian territory, then immediately backing away to avoid anti-aircraft fire. Russian aircraft use similar tactics but have the advantage of superior firepower, which allows them to fire rockets and gliding bombs from a greater distance. A recent report from the Royal United Services Institute assessed that because of these tactics, even a small number of Western fighters could have a major deterrent effect. 
While F-16s likely will not grant Ukraine air superiority, they will make the defense of the country's airspace easier and, if paired with JASMs or similar weapons, provide an important means of launching the type of long-range weapons which are likely necessary to force Russia out of Crimea and other fortified areas. A group of Ukrainian parliament members speaking at the German Marshall Fund in Washington in April said they wanted the F-16 because its radar can locate targets on the ground hundreds of miles away, allowing pilots to stay safely over Ukrainian-held territory while launching weapons into Russian-occupied areas. In addition to defense and deterrence, this also suggests that F-16s could feature in the later stages of the counteroffensive currently underway, which could take the entire rest of the year. Colonel Yuri Inat, a spokesman for the Ukrainian Air Force, seemed to confirm this, telling the New York Times that F-16s could provide cover for Ukrainian troops trying to advance and hold formerly occupied areas. He noted that it could also be used to cut off Russian planes that have started launching guided missiles more than 30 miles from the Ukrainian front line, to defend the sea route that lets Ukrainian grain leave the country and to push further into the Russian-occupied oblasts. All of this helps explain why the Kremlin seems so nervous about the possibility of F-16s in Ukrainian hands. When it became clear that the US would greenlight their training and eventual transfer, Russian diplomats had a minor meltdown. First, Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Rybakov said any transfer of the US jets to Ukraine would be pointless, since Russia's capabilities are more than enough to end the special military operation whenever they want. Now, by this point, we probably don't need to tell you that that's pure BS. When that was pointed out, Russian ambassador to the United States, Anatoly Antonov, went on to claim that even if the F-16s were transferred, they couldn't possibly be effective, since Ukraine lacks the proper infrastructure, pilots, and maintenance personnel. While this is slightly more true, given the country's incredible adaptability so far, there's no reason to think that Ukraine can't make F-16s work, given the right amount of time and training. The Kremlin knows this, and it seems to be making their threats increasingly desperate. When the statements by Antonov and Rybakov failed to scare NATO or the US, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov took the stage during a speech at a military conference in Tajikistan. He claimed that, we must keep in mind that one of the modifications of the F-16 can accommodate nuclear weapons. If they do not understand this, then they are worthless as military strategists and planners. This is obviously pretty ironic considering Russia's continual failures in military planning for the last year, but also shows a deep-seated worry from top officials. They likely don't think that the US would ever give Ukraine nuclear warheads, but know that even if F-16s do not change the battle space in the short term, they will bring Ukraine closer to the West and increase the country's military resilience. The West's response to these threats was also summed up pretty well in the reply to Lavrov by Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby that, if you're worried about Ukrainian military capabilities, then you should take your troops and leave Ukraine. This back and forth over F-16s highlights a larger trend in the war that Ukraine's warfighting increasingly looks like that of the West, rather than a former Soviet satellite state. Because Russia failed so badly to understand the depth of Ukrainian resolve, every step Putin and his cronies take pushes Ukraine towards NATO, the EU, and the US. By the end of the war, whenever that might come, Ukraine will have extremely close military, economic, and political ties to Europe and America. The F-16s are just the latest part of this broader shift but the fact that their transfer has been approved is another sign that the Ukraine of 2021 is not the same as the one we see today. War has transformed the country into a major regional military power, with advanced equipment and some of Europe's most battle-hardened troops. Even though Putin somehow hasn't learned his lesson yet, there's no doubt that Ukraine will play a major role in the future of European security. But what do you think? What does the transfer of F-16s to Ukraine mean for the future of the conflict? And will it be enough to overcome Russia's military? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. After repeatedly asking the US for a few of their MGM-140 Army Tactical Missile Systems, ATAC-Ms for short, Ukrainian forces will finally be getting this long-awaited upgrade to their arsenal. In September, military officials in Washington confirm they will be sending as many ATAC-Ms over the coming weeks as the US could reasonably spare. And as of mid-October, these high-tech surface-to-surface artillery weapons have been making an impact. But how? In what way? Why are these missiles so crucial for Ukraine compared to other weapons? Let's find out. While offering a special thanks to his friends at the White House recently, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky 
added that the missiles have more than proven themselves during a pair of synchronized nighttime attacks. Zelensky said that the atac -Ms were used against two military airfields, one in Berdyansk and the other in the Luhansk region, a dual strike that resulted in significant losses on the Russian side, including nine military helicopters, an anti-aircraft missile battery, and an ammunition storage depot. Bolstered by their recent upgrade from Washington, Ukrainian officials have stated plainly that, with these new weapons at hand, there will be nowhere left for Russian troops to hide within Ukraine's internationally recognized borders. This pair of attacks was executed shortly after Russia launched a surprise attack on the town of Avdivka in eastern Ukraine, encompassing three battalions comprised of some 2,000 troops, along with dozens of armored vehicles and a handful of jets providing air support this would turn out to be the largest assault carried out in this area so far. But this was only the latest flare-up of the ongoing contest for the much-contested municipality of Avdivka. Considered by both sides to be the gateway to the city of Donetsk, the capital of Ukraine's eastern Donbass region, Avdivka not only has significant strategic importance, but the town has been the stage for many frontline battles since Moscow annexed Crimea nine years ago, essentially triggering the conflict in eastern Ukraine. Since then, the town has been heavily fortified, making it extremely difficult for Russian troops to establish a foothold there. This has also turned the town, which had a pre-war population of nearly 32,000, but is now down to around 1,600 residents, mostly living in basements and other sub-ground dwellings, into a symbol of the Ukrainian people's unflinching resistance. Ukrainian defensive positions in Avdivka have allowed its forces to resist repeated Russian attacks, at least for now. At this point, Losing this territory would be a tough blow for Ukraine, both strategically and in terms of morale, especially after this summer's highly anticipated counteroffensive resulted in only marginal gains. So why is Biden giving atac -Ms to Ukraine such a big deal? Well, for one, Ukrainian forces have, so far, been able to fend off dozens of attacks, so it will certainly be interesting to see how the arrival of atac -Ms missiles on the battlefield shifts the advantage, and for two, the atac -Ms will undoubtedly play a crucial role on the battlefield, as Kyiv continues to ramp up its assaults on Russian-occupied areas of Crimea. Recently, Ukrainian forces have expanded their attempts to undermine Russian forces, including the launch of a devastating attack on a Russian naval base in Sevastopol back in September that damaged a ship and a submarine and injured 24 people. And more recently, there was the destruction of the two Russian landing crafts by Ukrainian sea drones, an overnight operation that was part of a series of escalating strikes on the peninsula. Ukraine insists that the strikes on Crimea, which have mostly targeted Russian naval bases and vessels, are a critical element of their overall counteroffensive strategy. Ultimately, they want to make it impossible for Russia to continue its assault on the Ukrainian mainland, and in the process, Kyiv is hoping to land a few strategic and symbolic blows against Russian forces which the atac -Ms should certainly help with, as focus shifts back toward Crimea. The escalation of attacks across Crimea begun after Russia allowed the Black Sea Grain Initiative to lapse this past July, a globally crucial deal that has allowed Ukraine to export grain by sea. Previously, foreign container ships were allowed to bypass Russia's blockade and navigate safely to Turkey's Bosphorus Strait, then onto global markets. Ukraine's uninterrupted export of grain is vital for stabilizing global food prices and bringing relief to many developing countries. The impact this war, and certainly the collapse of the Black Sea Grain Initiative, has had on global food markets has been disastrous, especially given that Ukraine is a major supplier of food to the World Food Programme WFP, an international organization within the UN that provides food assistance across the globe. At a glance, Ukraine's contribution makes up 10% of the global wheat market, 15% of the corn market, and 13% of the barley market. It's also a key player in the world's sunflower oil market, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization FAO, another organization within the UN. As many as 47 million people could face serious problems in terms of food insecurity as a result of this war. And now, with Russia's Black Sea Fleet resuming its blockade of Ukraine's ports, vital grain exports are being prevented, creating a direct threat to global food security, what Zelensky has simply called another attempt by Russia to weaponize hunger and destabilize the global food market. This situation has left Ukraine eager to secure its position in Crimea, which has meant, along with their missiles and drone strikes, a stepping up of their clandestine operations as well. 
Recently in the occupied city of Luhansk, a car explosion killed pro-Moscow former head of police Mikhail Filipenenko. Representatives of Ukraine's defense intelligence have claimed responsibility for the apparent assassination, saying it was a joint operation carried out with pro-Ukrainian partisans, before issuing a warning of retribution to other pro-Russian officials positioned in occupied areas. There was also, quite recently, the bombing of a Russian train outside the city of Ryazan, about 196 kilometers 122 miles, southeast of Moscow. Placed on a section of track, the improvised explosive device derailed 19 freight cars and caused several injuries. And though Kyiv hasn't officially taken responsibility, that hasn't stopped the Kremlin from making the accusation, citing a series of recent cross-border strikes by Ukrainian forces and their allies. The question seems to be now, other than the success they've already had, how will Kyiv make the most of their new weapon? Ukrainian forces were already familiar with the wheeled M142 high-mobility artillery rocket system, a mobile rocket launcher commonly known as the HIMARS, that are used to carry and fire ATACMs. Up until now, though, the US had only been supplying shorter-range guided rockets, fired from a HIMARS mobile launcher or a tracked M270 multiple launch rocket system, or MLRS. The longest range variants of the ATACMs can strike targets out to a distance of 300 kilometers, 190 miles. This extension of their reach will more than likely allow Ukrainian forces to launch attacks further into Russian-held territories, including the Crimean Peninsula and other areas bordering the Black Sea. So you might be wondering, besides its impressive range, what's the big deal with ATACMs? Well, to start, most of these 4-meter-long missiles carry a WDU-18 230 kilogram 500 pound blast fragmentation warhead they can travel in excess of mach 3 around 3700 kilometers 2300 miles per hour and depending on which variant you choose they can cost between 820,000 and 1.7 million dollars a piece the impressive speed of the atac ms compared to similar cruise missiles such as the uk's storm shadow or russia's kh-101 has been one of its key selling points and is due largely to the fact that the ATAC-Ms is, essentially, a ballistic missile with a rocket engine strapped to its back, which makes them very hard to shoot out of the sky. Okay, so if these high-tech precision missiles come with a rocket engine on the back, what comes at the front? When it comes to the payload carried on the ATAC-Ms, you've really got two options. One is a unitary warhead, which is basically what it sounds like, a single explosive charge. The other is a submunition warhead, a container filled with lots of submunitions or bomblets. These are also mostly what they sound like, a bunch of little bombs that can be dispersed over a large target area. In terms of ATAC-Ms, this means hundreds of steel-cased balls filled with incendiary pellets. So which one is better? Well, it largely depends on your intended target. Unitary warheads are better for destroying specific targets, say a stationary tank, ammunition depot, or a large artillery piece while submunition warheads will be more effective against moving targets, say a convoy of vehicles or an advancing column of troops. Both warhead variations have been designed with specific target categories in mind, but both can be highly effective against a wide variety of individual targets too. The ATAC-Ms platform also comes with a number of variants, though it's not 100% clear which one President Biden ended up passing on to the Ukrainians. The most widely produced variant is the M39 Block 1, which was added to the US's arsenal in 1991. The original design for this variant had a range of 25 to 165 kilometers, 15 to 100 miles, and carried a payload of 950 incendiary bomblets, each about the size of a baseball and weighing around 0.6 kilograms. And when dispersed above a target, these bomblets can cover an area of 33,000 square meters, 360,000 square feet. Although no longer in production, about 1,650 of the M39 Block 1 variants were made, with several hundred of those being used in combat during both Operation Desert Storm and Operation Iraqi Freedom. All remaining missiles have been modified to carry a unitary fragmentation warhead. But this hasn't been the only variant to be used in combat over the years. With nearly double the range and a GPS-aided guidance system, the M39A1 variant can reach targets anywhere from 12 to 185 miles, 20 to 300 kilometers away, but carries a somewhat smaller payload of just 300 incendiary bomblets. Entering the US's arsenal in 1997, some 610 of these were produced, with around 74 being used in combat, primarily during Operation Iraqi Freedom. 
This variation is no longer in production, and all remaining units have also had their cluster munition payloads swapped out for a single warhead. Arriving in 2001, the M48 variant, a quick-reaction unitary missile with a GPS-aided guidance system, carries a single 230kg high-explosive warhead and has a maximum range of 185 miles 300 km. It should be noted that when a fragmentation warhead, like the one found on this variant and many others, explodes, the blast sends thousands of metallic fragments flying in every direction, much like a 360-degree spray of bullets. Between 2001 and 2004, 176 M48s were produced, 16 of which were used during Operation Iraqi Freedom, while another 42 appeared in combat during Operation Enduring Freedom. The remaining missiles are in the possession of the US Army and Marine Corps. Then there's the M57 variant, which is similar in many ways to the M48, mainly in its ability to carry a single high-explosive warhead out to a distance of some 185 miles or 300 kilometers. Going into production directly after the M48 went out, a little over 500 of these were made, but only 33 have been used in combat, reportedly during Operation Enduring Freedom. The M57 is also very accurate, boasting a circular error probability CEP, of less than 9 meters or 30 feet. Typically expressed as a radius, CEP is an important measurement for assessing the accuracy of guided munitions, such as missiles. CEP and missile accuracy in general can be influenced by a range of factors, including guidance system technology and environmental conditions. So essentially, the smaller the CEP, the more accurate the system is considered to be. Let's say, for example, a missile has a CEP of 20 meters. This means there's a high probability, usually greater than 50%, that the actual point of impact will be within a 20 meters radius of the intended target which means that an M57 atac ms missile, fired from, let's say, Brussels, Belgium or Dunkirk, could reliably hit the Eiffel Tower, as well as a range of smaller targets located at the same distances. Which brings us to the last variant we're going to look at, but certainly not the least, the M57A1, which is basically identical to the M57 in terms of general specifications and capabilities, except for one major difference. The warhead found on this variant comes with an adjustable blast height, allowing for a wider dispersion of bomb fragments should the situation call for it. After looking more closely at the atac -Ms, we can definitely conclude that it has superior speed, range, versatility, accuracy, and explosive power than any other surface-to-surface -surface missile on the market. Its most notable feature, however, might just be the mobility of the system from which it's launched. Because the atac -Ms can be launched from a mobile ground vehicle like the HIMARS, which they're already familiar with, Ukrainian troops can easily shoot and then move over a variety of different terrains. Ukrainian combatants can hide if necessary, they can avoid retaliatory attacks, and most importantly, they can create a sense of uncertainty for the Russians, who won't be able to predict where the next strike might be coming from. In practical terms, this means that a Ukrainian mobile artillery unit traveling in an atac -Ms equipped HIMARS could stop basically anywhere, anytime, and launch a precision attack on a target it would take them perhaps five to six hours to drive to, if they could reach it by land at all. Clearly, Washington's gift of the atac -Ms has opened up a range of strategic options for Ukraine's perpetually outnumbered forces, options that could lead to plenty of scenarios where Ukraine has a significant battlefield advantage. The arrival of the atac -Ms could very well allow for easier destruction of Russia's air defense systems, airfields, and other military installations deep within the enemy's territory, as we've already seen Ukraine do when they recently used their new missiles to wipe out a pair of Russian airbases. In the wake of this recent news, many of Ukraine's supporters have been quick to applaud Biden's generosity, but it's also important not to get carried away here. Old Uncle Joe didn't just happily hand over a bunch of his precious atac -Ms the first time Zelensky asked for them. The folks in Washington have actually been quite hesitant to do so, and for two pretty good reasons. One, there's the risk that significantly increasing Kyiv's fighting ability might also increase the tension between the US and Russia. And two, the US also had its own national security needs to consider, as its stockpile of atac -Ms, which have been out of production since 2017, has continued to dwindle. The latter issue, however, keeping enough atac -Ms on hand to balance its own security needs with those of Ukraine and Europe as a whole, 
seems to have been mostly resolved by the recent arrival of a suitable replacement, and it is fancy. In March 2016, Lockheed Martin and Raytheon Technologies announced they'd be working in tandem to develop a missile that would meet the US Army's replacement requirements. This new missile, if it would indeed end up shouldering out the ATAC-Ms, would need not only advanced propulsion, allowing it to fly faster and farther, it would also need to be thinner and sleeker. For what purpose, you ask? So that the loadout could be increased to two per pod, doubling the number of missiles that could be carried by the HIMARS or tracked by the M270 MLRS. Well, the Army ultimately got what they wanted, introducing the Precision Strike Missile, or PRISM for short, which has reportedly left production and will be entering US stockpiles in the near future, if it hasn't already. The PRISM, which would ultimately be developed by Lockheed Martin, is at the leading edge of long-range Precision Strike missiles. With an equally cool-sounding name compared to the ATAC-Ms, this next-generation surface-to-surface weapon uses enhanced attack capabilities to neutralize, suppress, and destroy targets at a distance of 310 plus miles, over 499 kilometers. On top of increased range, lethality, in-flight survivability, and missile loadout, the PRISM also comes with an advanced cluster munition warhead comprised of preformed fragments. While the PRISM development program started out as a competitive effort between Lockheed and Raytheon, Raytheon would end up withdrawing from the competition in early 2020 due to technical issues that delayed their missile's flight test. The original intent of both companies was to reach a maximum range of no more than 499 kilometers, due to restrictions outlined in the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, signed by former President Ronald Reagan and former Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev in 1987. Among other restrictions, the INF Treaty prevents signatories from developing missiles that can travel 500 kilometers or more, but these limitations went out the window in August 2019, when former President Donald Trump decided to withdraw from the treaty. This decision came after more than a decade of accusations, coming from both the US and Russia, that the other had violated the terms of the treaty. And so, with a brand new long-range precision missile in their arsenal, and who knows what variants on the way, the only thing that will stop Washington from providing ATAC-Ms to Ukraine was Russian President Vladimir Putin's uncertain reaction. In short, he wasn't pleased. So far, Putin has said that the US providing Kyiv with ATAC-Ms was a big mistake, and that the US is wading deeper and deeper into a conflict the Russian leader believes is none of its business. Previously, Putin called the delivery of ATAC-Ms to Ukraine a red line that the US had better not cross. Yet, he's also stated that the ATAC-Ms will not make a significant difference on the battlefield, that Russian forces will have no trouble repelling attacks, and this intrusion by the US will only serve to prolong this war and bring more suffering to the people of Ukraine. But this isn't the first time Putin has brought up the subject of long-range missiles. When Russia initially marched more than 100,000 troops to the border of Ukraine, two months before they invaded, the Kremlin also sent NATO a list of demands that was structured as more of a one-sided treaty, along with the articles insisting that NATO both shuts its doors to new members and remove all its forces from the 14 countries that joined after the Soviet Union collapsed. One article declares that no land-based missiles be deployed to areas that would allow them to reach any territory belonging to Russia. Technically, the missiles haven't gotten closer, their range has just increased, but still, this was the red line Putin was referring to. But now that it's been crossed, the Russian president doesn't seem overly concerned. This could be because he was expecting it, or because the delivery of the ATAC-Ms, however significant their future impact could be, is only a small part of a much larger delivery from the US, a delivery that's come to exceed $76 billion in humanitarian, financial, and military support, which has been offered to Ukraine by the Biden administration and the US Congress since the war began. While dozens of other countries have also provided large aid packages to Ukraine, including most members of NATO and the European Union, the US has really taken the lead. So far, the US has delivered surveillance and attack drones, coastal defense ships, satellite communications equipment, and advanced surveillance and radar systems. They've sent over hundreds of Abrams tanks and artillery pieces, thousands of Humvees and other tactical vehicles, tens of thousands of rockets, missiles, and various other munitions, not to mention several types of anti-aircraft missiles including 12 National Advanced Surface-to-Air Missile Systems NASAMs, and one Patriot Air Defense Battery plus munitions. And on top of 35,000 grenade launchers and small arms with ammunition, 
Other extremely helpful but less publicized items the US has sent to Ukraine include night vision and thermal imagery systems, laser rangefinders, C4 explosives, explosive ordnance disposal equipment, M18A1 Claymore mines, cold weather gear, and generators. Breaking down the numbers, around $3.9 billion, or 5% of the total, has gone to humanitarian aid in the form of emergency food assistance, healthcare, and refugee support, among other resources, while another $26.4 billion, or 34%, has gone to financial and budgetary aid via loans and the Economic Support Fund, an economic assistance fund used to advance the US's political and strategic interests by helping allied countries meet their political, economic, and security needs. And the rest of that $75-plus billion dollars that's all gone directly or indirectly to weapons, ammunition, and military equipment. Nearly a quarter of the total, around $18.3 billion, has been allocated for security assistance in the form of training, equipment, weapons, and logistic support provided via the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, a program initiated by the U.S. Department of Defense with the intention of providing help to Ukraine by enhancing its defense capabilities and mitigating certain security challenges, mainly a Russian invasion. Another $23.5 billion worth of weapons and military equipment has come directly from the DoD's personal supply. And still, another $4.7 billion has come in the form of grants and loans for weapons and equipment via the Foreign Military Financing Program, another U.S. initiative, this one providing grants and loans to nations so they can purchase weapons, defense equipment and services, and military training from the U.S. through government-to-government -government sales. Long before crossing Putin's metaphorical red line with his delivery of ATAC Ms, Biden also stirred up the hornet's nest, as well as some international controversy, when he agreed to furnish Ukraine with cluster munitions, which most countries have banned due to the increased risk their use poses to civilians by 1. their lack of precision, and 2. the danger of undetonated ordnance being triggered accidentally later on. Still, a number of analysts in the West have asserted that the assistance offered by the US as well as its allies, has been crucial in Ukraine's continued defense and has even created the opportunity to launch a number of critical counteroffensives against Russia. Some analysts as well as many supporters of Ukraine also believe the country's failure to expel Russia will result in the subjugation of millions of Ukrainians, while simultaneously fueling Putin's ambitions to recover territory that once belonged to the former Soviet Union, which might also end up encouraging China to pursue or enhance similar aggressive tactics, which means military support for Ukraine will likely continue. To a significant degree, though it has certainly not been alone, the US has led the world in offering security assistance to Ukraine. Their javelins have halted Russian tanks during their savage assault on Kyiv, their air defense systems have intercepted Russian strikes aimed at Ukrainian infrastructure. The US has also provided financial and humanitarian assistance which has helped Ukraine maintain highly fundamental services such as healthcare and heat. Many NATO members, including the US and other allied nations, have, too, been cautious about getting directly involved in the conflict, being concerned primarily with Putin's not-so-subtle threats of starting a nuclear war. As we've seen, however, governments across the world have overcome their initial hesitancy and provided Ukraine with increasingly sophisticated assets, including battle tanks, modern fighter aircraft, and now, high-tech, long-range, precision missile systems. But what do you think? Has the US crossed a line by sending atac -Ms to Ukraine? Should NATO and its allies simply stay out of it? Are we inching closer to a global nuclear conflict instigated by Russia? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. At this point, we're pretty sure that Putin is sticking his head into a paper bag in panic and trying not to hyperventilate on a daily basis. While he has several reasons for doing this, losing thousands of tanks on the battlefield in Ukraine, the ongoing NATO expansion, coup attempts, and more, there's another looming threat that he can't seem to escape. Ukraine is equipped with US weapons, and Russia can't seem to stop them. But why? Is Putin really that incompetent? What are these weapons, and how come Putin can't fight them off? Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine began more than a year ago, the United States has committed more than $45 billion worth of aid to help the country defend its sovereignty. Much of this has taken the form of high-tech, lethal military equipment. The assistance has proven to be critical for Ukraine's battlefield success and a nightmare for Putin and his top military planners. 
Now 19 months into the conflict, it could make all the difference in Ukraine's slowly growing counteroffensive. So let's take a look at what equipment the US has sent so far, what else might it be planning to send, and why Russian troops seem to be so helpless against US exported firepower. Among the most important weapons the US has sent so far to Ukraine is the FGM-148 Javelin, a potent anti-tank guided missile system or ATGM. Jointly manufactured by defense giants Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, the Javelin first entered service in 1996 as a replacement for the older M47 Dragon missile. It has also proven to be one of the most effective pieces of US military aid. Ukraine has received more than 7,000 javelins since the start of the invasion, and has put them to remarkable use. Each javelin system consists of two parts, the launch tube assembly and the reusable command launch unit, or CLU. The CLU works as the brains of the javelin, and features four times magnification as well as night vision and thermal sights. This allows for independent target verification, meaning small, independent squads can use javelins effectively. Before firing, a 12 times magnification setting allows users to zoom in on a target for identification. To fire, the gunner switches to a seeker FOV mode with 9 times magnification, which is fed into the missile's guidance unit to lock onto a target. One of the javelin's biggest strengths is its trajectory. It features two modes, direct fire and top attack. In top attack mode, its missiles travel in a high arc in order to strike the less armored section of a tank at the top of its turret. Its automatic infrared guidance and fire-and-forget design also allows the user to seek cover immediately after launch and avoid retaliatory strikes. Javelins can also penetrate even the toughest tank armor, as they are fitted with powerful 19-pound tandem warheads. A primary charge penetrates the thick composite armor, while a secondary charge follows and detonates inside the tank. However, these features also make javelins expensive, at about $200,000 per unit and $78,000 per replacement missile. Money aside, javelins have become a staple of Ukraine's defense throughout the war so far, even being turned into an inspirational internet meme termed Saint Javelin by Ukrainian-Canadian journalist Christian Boris. Even as the invasion shifted into its current brutal back-and-forth of artillery barrages trench warfare, the Javelin has continued to prove invaluable to Ukrainian forces. Countless videos like this one shared by Yahoo News have shown unsuspecting Russian troops and tank columns rolling into ambushes by Javelin-wielding Ukrainians. As the Javelins are fired, tanks and other armored vehicles can be seen exploding and catching fire. One tank was able to fire before it was struck and immobilized, billowing smoke. At one point in the video, three desperate Russian soldiers can be seen jumping out of a burning vehicle and running away from it. Scenes like this show why the Javelin is among the most effective tools the US has given Ukraine to beat back Russia, but their usefulness has a lot to do with the issues in Russian combat doctrine. Russian tank tactics, which have not evolved much since the 1990s, involve operating tank columns on their own, without the aid of close infantry support. Usually in modern combined arms warfare, infantry units support tanks by keeping hunter-killer teams away while putting down covering fire and stopping columns from rolling into ambushes. But because Russia operates its armor independently, Ukrainian troops have been able to use javelins and other ATGMs to wreak havoc on unsuspecting tanks. The next crucial US weapon which has been utilized in Ukraine are several varieties of kamikaze drones. These have become a serious thorn in Putin's side, giving him a small taste of his own medicine. First is the switchblade. The drone's name comes from the way the spring-loaded wings are folded up inside a tube and flipped out once released. Designed and manufactured by California defense company Avex Aerospace, switchblade drones are light and small enough to fit in a backpack. Launched from a portable two-foot tube, each drone flies to the target area and can loiter, waiting for its target for up to an hour. Once the target approaches, an operator instructs the drone to dive toward enemy personnel and detonate a small grenade-like charge, releasing a shotgun spray of shrapnel in a specific direction. Its loitering nature means that unlike most other weapons, the switchblade can wave off or abort a mission if the situation changes after launch, allowing it to engage a secondary target or destroy itself without inflicting casualties or damage to property. Its small size and extended operation time also make it great for destroying entrenched infantry, or even lightly armored vehicles like trucks. 
Videos like this one, shared on Twitter by open source analyst Abraxas Spa, show Ukrainian operators launching switchblades from city streets before retreating to hidden positions to help guide them. While there are no definitive numbers on targets eliminated with switchblade drones, it seems likely that they have accounted for hundreds of Russian casualties and equipment losses. There are also two varieties of the drone, the 300 and 600 models. The Switchblade 300 was widely used by US troops in Afghanistan against the Taliban, but considered less than ideal for the higher intensity warfare in Ukraine. Most of those given to Ukraine appear to be the 600 model, which is much larger and heavier, but has a longer flight time and larger payload, making it ideal for taking out heavy armor or fortified positions. But US military aid extended beyond the Switchblade as well. The Pentagon has also given Ukrainian forces a number of Phoenix Ghost drones. These were also developed by AVEX under the US military's Big Safari weapons program, meant to rapidly acquire and deploy weapons to meet unexpected threats without relying on new research and development. The US has supplied over 1,000 of these killer drones so far, which have proven to be similarly lethal in the hands of Ukrainian operators. While even the larger switchblades are limited to an hour of loitering, the Phoenix Ghost can hover over an area for up to six hours at a time, making it a much deadlier surprise weapon. It can also conduct both day and nighttime surveillance, thanks to its advanced infrared sensors. But like the switchblade, once a target has been detected and identified, the drone dives downwards and explodes on impact. The primary downside of the Phoenix Ghost drone appears to be its reduced speed, which appears in videos to be roughly half that of the Switchblade 600. Even so, Alexei Arostovich, advisor to the Ukrainian President's Office, told reporters last year that 580 of such units equals about 350 destroyed targets in the close rear, indicating a roughly 60% success rate. It's unclear how much this has changed, but it seems likely that US-supplied loitering munitions continue to play a big role in Ukraine's ability to strike behind Russian lines. The latest US aid package to Ukraine from July 2023, containing over $1.3 billion of equipment, also reportedly contains hundreds of new switchblades and Phoenix ghosts. This is especially important since Kyiv acknowledged in May that its forces are losing about 10,000 drones per month during both intelligence gathering and strike activities. Similarly, military experts have said the relatively large losses of troops and slow advance of Ukrainians' recently launched counteroffensive are due primarily to the dense landmines Russian troops have laid in anticipation. That potentially deadly terrain separating defenders from invading forces will therefore make additional drones capable of inflicting precise attacks on distant targets especially useful. But just why is Russia having so much trouble dealing with these US-made drones? The simple answer is that the country hasn't effectively prepared for modern warfare. Despite its pre-invasion claims that its military could take on even the USA, the fact of the matter is that Russian commanders have proven they have no idea how to wage modern, combined arms warfare. By keeping different elements of their forces isolated and working individually, rather than in coordination, everything from Russian armor to supply lines to infantry troops are far more vulnerable than they should be. There's also the small problem that intelligence gathering among different elements of the Russian military is essentially non-existent. Because different Russian officials are constantly out to get each other and competing for power and influence, they have a strong incentive to let each other's forces take most of the losses to try and preserve their own power. Obviously, this doesn't work very well when you're facing a determined and increasingly well-armed enemy like Ukraine. The astronomical Russian casualties after a year and a half of fighting are proof enough that Western smart munitions like the Switchblade and Phoenix Ghost are more than Putin's commanders can handle. The less obvious answer is that while Russia is especially unprepared, very few militaries today are prepared to effectively counter the threat of loitering aerial munitions. Just about any force on the planet, including the US itself, would be hard-pressed to defend against repeated strikes by kamikaze drones. There's simply no way to provide infantry troops with effective protection from them, especially as anti-aircraft guns can almost never hit every drone launched. The best way to defend against something like the Switchblade or Phoenix Ghost are electronic countermeasures, such as EMP pulses, which can knock out the signal of overhead drones. Even so, Russia simply does not have the capabilities to stop their strikes, making these some of the most effective weapons supplied to Ukraine so far. 
Another critical piece of military hardware that Russia has struggled against is the Stinger missile system. At the start of the war, large numbers of Russian aircraft were operating over Ukraine's airspace, leading to predictions that they would soon establish air superiority, but this wasn't on the cards either. And one main reason is the FIM-92 Stinger missile and its counterparts from around the world given to Ukraine. First entering service in 1981, the Stinger is a man-portable air defense system, or MANPADS, developed by defense giant Raytheon. Russia first encountered these deadly platforms all the way back in 1985, during its invasion of Afghanistan. Back then, the US supplied the Afghan Mujahideen fighters with Stingers, which they put to remarkable use for the next few years. The Stinger hasn't changed much since then. It can engage a target from nearly two and a half miles away, making it perfect for taking out low-flying aircraft and helicopters. The Stinger's missile is 5 feet long and 2.8 inches in diameter. The missile itself weighs 22 pounds, while the missile with its launch tube and integral sight fitted with a grip stock and identification friend or foe IFF antenna weighs approximately 34 pounds. The Stinger uses a smart seeker head able to differentiate between an enemy's exhaust plume and engines helping it home in on even rapidly moving targets. The warhead itself is roughly 2.3 pounds of HTA-3 explosive, a deadly mix of HMX, TNT, and aluminium powder. This does not make the Stinger any less effective, however, since its targeting system allows it to strike the vulnerable engines of enemy aircraft. To fire the missile, a BCU battery coolant unit is inserted into the grip stock. This device consists of a supply of high-pressure argon gas, which is injected into the seeker to cryogenically cool it to operating temperature, and a thermal battery which provides power for target acquisition. A single BCU provides power and coolant for roughly 45 seconds, after which another must be inserted if the missile has not been fired. Guidance to the target is initially achieved through proportional navigation, but once in flight, switches to another mode, which is what allows the missile to avoid exhaust plumes. The answer to why the Stingers have been so effective against Russia this time around again has a lot to do with terrible military doctrine and planning. Russia has long struggled to integrate its use of air power with ground campaigns, something which Ukrainians have been exploiting for more than a year. Because Russia conducted its air sorties independently of ground advances, Ukraine was able to shoot down huge numbers of its low-flying vehicles with Stingers and other manpad systems. This was also not helped by Russia's basic lack of precision targeting. Most of its aircraft, especially older models, lack the modern targeting pods found on Western jets, meaning they have to dip low to have any hope of precise strikes on enemy positions. This leaves them extremely vulnerable to surface-to-air missiles like the Stinger, especially when they cannot detect where the missiles are coming from. Next, no video about US weapons would be complete without mention of the HIMARS system. This powerful rocket artillery system is one of the crown jewels of US aid to Ukraine, and in recent months, reports suggest they have become increasingly decisive in determining the direction of the war. HIMARS stands for High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, a variety of the MLRS rockets, which have been in use since the 1990s. The HIMARS are considered most effective for attacking stationary targets such as infrastructure and troops in a concentrated area but their extremely long range means that they can be used from far behind the front lines. As Ian Williams, Deputy Director of the Missile Defense Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, has noted, HIMARS is one of the world's most advanced rocket artillery systems. Its range is farther than anything the Ukrainians had, so when that was transferred, they got the ability to strike targets deeper behind the front lines and much more accurately. Other experts largely concur and many have pointed out that without the use of HIMARS, Ukraine would not have been able to liberate nearly as much territory as it has. HIMARS rockets have been particularly effective in fighting Russia's offensive in Donbass by allowing Ukraine to attack Russian supply and ammunition depots. They were also crucial in forcing Russia to withdraw from Kherson. George Barros, an analyst on the Russia and Ukraine portfolio at the Institute for the Study of War, concluded that, that was only possible because the Ukrainians had this extended strike capability to degrade those bridges. Without the HIMARS, I don't think the Ukrainians would have liberated Kherson. And while it's certainly powerful, the HIMARS does not have either the range or payload of its cousin, the M270 MLRS. But what it lacks in range and firepower, the HIMARS more than makes up for in maneuverability. Its concept came about at the end of the Cold War when it became apparent that the US military would be fighting more low-intensity conflicts 
in multiple environments. This led the Pentagon to move away from clunky, traditional rocket artillery and towards systems with a lighter footprint. It's this speed and maneuverability which has made the HIMARS so important for Ukraine's war effort. Faced with Russia's overwhelming numbers, Ukraine needed a platform able to rapidly deliver a payload and depart before it could be targeted with enemy counter-battery fire or airstrikes. Traditional artillery would most likely have been blown to bits before it could be moved, have let them launch numerous strikes without substantial retaliation, and once a HIMARS is fired, it usually finds its target. Each of its six GLMRS rockets has a range of 57 miles and is armed with a high-precision warhead. This means it can fire from well outside the range of traditional artillery and still hit its targets within several meters of accuracy. This has enabled Ukraine to strike at highly entrenched Russian positions, targeting their weakest points. HIMARS rockets can also each be set to independent targets or used for repeated strikes on the same area of a fortification. Since Ukraine received its HIMARS, it has used them to take out everything from ammunition depots to command and control centers, managing to slow Russian advances to a crawl. Yet despite devoting large amounts of air power to taking out the missiles, Russia has apparently failed to touch 90% of them, instead losing more and more aircraft to stingers every time it's tried. Part of the reason for this is that in addition to utilizing the HIMARS mobility, Ukraine also created multiple dummies consisting of a generic heavy-duty truck frame, painted green and made to look as though it's carrying missiles. Ukraine has also apparently gotten so good at using HIMARS that it has actually been able to take out stalled tank columns, despite the system's intended use against stationary targets. As of last month, the US has supplied 38 HIMARS to Ukraine, but soon it may need more. Former Ukrainian Marine and captured British fighter Aidan Aslin recently told Newsweek that Russia appears to be hoarding its battlefield resources further away out of HIMARS range. This suggests that the country will soon need more weapons with even greater reach, such as ATAC-Ms or British Storm Shadow missiles. But experts also say the real advantage of sending different long-range missiles lies not in their individual capabilities, but in the numbers. The more missiles Kyiv can get its hands on, the more chances they have to strike Russian targets and the more damage they can do. All of this suggests that while the war shows no signs of stopping soon, Russia remains unable to deal with the superior firepower the US has provided Ukraine. It's not likely to get any better anytime soon either, as Russia continues to run out of resources and trained personnel. But what do you think? Will more US weapons ultimately be what ends the war? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. Imagine a non-guided aerial weapon, meticulously designed to unleash its power upon release from an aircraft. The MK-20, also called the CBU-100 Cluster Bomb, boasts a robust body crafted from top-notch aluminium, clocking in at just under 500 pounds. But what sets this weapon apart is what happens next. Once airborne, the container housing 247 heat submunitions, known as MK-118, dramatically opens causing them to rain down on a designated target zone with devastating force. Putin, are you scared yet? Well, you should be. Ukraine just asked the US for a bunch of these babies and its request has been generously granted. This, however, has been the subject of some controversy. But why? How is Ukraine using this weapon and what could it mean for the war going forward? Let's find out. On Friday, July 7th, 2023, the United States declared that it would be supplying Ukraine with cluster bombs in a decision that President Joe Biden said had been a very difficult one to make. The move was controversial even among America's closest allies. The United Kingdom, Canada and New Zealand, partners with the United States in the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance, all said they were opposed to the move. Spain, a NATO ally, also declared its opposition. The United Nations Human Rights Office also opposed the measure and urged both sides in the war to stop the use of cluster bombs without delay. As mentioned, cluster bombs are dropped from a plane or delivered from an artillery shell, rocket or missile. The weapon begins as a single container. This container then breaks apart and releases many small bomblets indiscriminately over a wide area. Over 120 countries have banned the use of these weapons because of this indiscriminate nature, fearing the risks that they pose to civilians. The individual cluster bomblets that get released from the initial container also have a high rate of failure. Many of them are duds. These duds can then linger on the ground for decades and accidentally go off when somebody interacts with them, 
Cluster bombs therefore pose some of the same problems to civilians that landmines do. For example, the United States dropped 260 million cluster munitions in Laos as part of its operations in the Vietnam War. Over 60 years later, large tracts of land in Laos remain uninhabited because of unexploded cluster bomblets in the area. The United States and Russia are not parties to the Convention on Cluster Munitions. This treaty, which went into effect on August 1, 2010, bans the countries that adhere to it from using, acquiring, developing, stockpiling and transferring cluster munitions. Countries involved in the convention are even prohibited from assisting other countries from interacting with cluster bombs in any way. They cannot help them manufacture their own cluster weapons, for example. Ukraine is not a signatory to the Convention on Cluster Munitions either, and in April 2023 at the Munich Security Conference, it requested the United States to deliver these weapons, which it has long desired. However, this desire could harm its international image, which up until this point was almost unanimously positive. Amnesty International and other human rights groups condemned the White House's decision to provide the Ukrainian military with cluster bombs, warning of the threat these weapons could pose to civilians during and after the war. United States National Secretary Advisor Jake Sullivan countered the controversy by declaring that the cluster bombs the United States would be sending to Ukraine failed at far less frequent rates than the versions that the Russians had already been using in the war. The United States has a domestic law on the books that bans the production, use or transfer of cluster bombs which have a failure rate greater than 1%. Sullivan said that American cluster munitions in question fail at less than 2.5%, compared to Russian bombs that have dud rates between 30 and 40%. Nevertheless, by admitting this, he also tacitly admitted that the Biden administration was disregarding the law. Russia's defense and foreign ministry were publicly unfazed by the announcement. They instead dismissed it as an act of desperation. In accepting delivery of the cluster bombs, Ukraine promised that it would not use them on Russian territory. There were other conditions too, which we'll get into in a moment. For Ukraine, a feeling of necessity surrounds the use of cluster bombs. At the beginning of July, the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, Valery Zaluzhny, admitted that the counteroffensive in Donbass and Zaporizhia that began in June was not making the progress that he had desired. He blamed the slow pace of the operations on a lack of adequate firepower, especially artillery and air support. General Zaluzny particularly complained about the lack of adequate fighter jets to provide air support, saying that the Western planes he wanted were a generation more advanced than the planes available to him. Ukraine has long desired cluster bombs to more effectively target Russian defenses, formations of tanks and armored vehicles, and troop formations. Because cluster bombs focus their attack on a wide area, the Ukrainians would need less of them to destroy Russian assets, in comparison to the more narrowly targeted weapons Ukraine has been using. Ammunition expenditures would decrease and accuracy would become less important. Given Ukraine's shortage of the artillery shells it desperately needs if its counteroffensive is to make the headway at once, the delivery of American cluster bombs is a welcome one for Kyiv. A British general, Sir Richard Shiriff, NATO's former Deputy Supreme Allied Commander in Europe mentioned that the decision had utility. Arming the Ukrainians with cluster bombs, he said, would make it easier for them to break through Russian lines. He blamed the West for failing to provide adequate firepower early enough, therefore making the use of cluster bombs necessary now. The cluster weapon in question is the dual-purposed Improved Conventional Munition DPICM. This is an artillery shell that bursts apart and drops 88 separate bomblets over the target area. The cluster shell has a dud rate of around 3%, so its delivery would violate American law. In September 2022, General Zaluzny wrote an article requesting that the United States provide Ukraine with the DPICM, which is currently being phased out in the US Armed Forces in favor of the CDAEM cluster round, which has a dud rate of 1% or less, in line with American standards first set by the Obama administration. Note that this standard is different from the law, which forbids the transfer of cluster munitions with a failure rate greater than 1%. The Ukrainian top general is now finally getting his wish. Another weapon the Ukrainians badly want is the airdropped Mark 20 Rock I-2 cluster bomb, also known as the CBU-100, which weighs about 500 pounds in total. It is a gravity bomb that, once released from the air, bursts apart into 247 separate Mark 118 bomblets that rain down over the designated target area. The target area's range can be adjusted based on the altitude that the original container is set to burst apart in. The Mark 118 bomblets are steered by fins at the back, 
and have electrical and mechanical fuses that activate once they are released from the original CBU-100. Once the bombnet's noses hit a hard surface, the ordnance detonates. Reportedly, the Ukrainians do not want to use the Mark 20 Rokai II cluster bomb in its traditional way, because Ukraine already has better cluster-type weapons in its arsenal that can be delivered via HIMARS and other systems. The coming DPICM artillery shells add to this capability. Rather, the Ukrainians seem to want to dismantle the Mark 20 container and place the individual Mark 118 bomblets on drones. These bomblets are designed for maximum penetration against enemy armored assets. The shape of the design allows for puncturing of up to 190 mm of armor. The bomblets are also aerodynamically sound. These factors make them ideal candidates for drone operations against Russian armored formations. Ukraine has proven very effective in the practice of drone warfare. In May, it launched dozens of drone attacks to weaken the Russian lines in preparation for the counteroffensive it launched in Zaporizhia and around Bakhmut in June. Additionally, Ukraine has carried out drone attacks far beyond the Russian lines. Combining the drone capability with the wider area effect of a cluster bomb is something the Ukrainian military is very keen on trying, as it seeks any advantage it can find in the counteroffensive. The Mark 20's manufacturer, a company called Textron Systems, reportedly stopped making this weapon in 2016, following the United States' decision to discontinue sales of the bomb to Saudi Arabia. However, the United States has large stockpiles of the Mark 20 containers and the Mark 118 bomblets, more than enough to provide them in large numbers to the Ukrainian military. So far, the United States has not yet agreed to deliver this weapon to Ukraine. We will need to wait and see if that changes. Although neither the United States nor Ukraine joined the Convention on Cluster Munitions, the decision to use them has still created a lot of controversy among NATO members and other like-minded countries. The United States is by far its most important partner, but Ukraine still needs the support of these other nations which have signed the Convention on Cluster Munitions. These countries provide Ukraine with military and financial aid, and all of this help is needed. Therefore, Ukraine will probably want to be careful in how it uses the cluster munitions when they arrive on the battlefield. So where would the Ukrainian military use these weapons and where would it be less likely to use them? Ukraine will probably want to use its new cluster artillery shells in areas where its counteroffensive has stalled. This would be in Zaporizhia, in the drive toward the city of Tokmak. Perhaps anticipating this, Russian reports suggest that Ukrainian troops had already struck areas near Tokmak, the probable initial objective for Ukraine on the Zaporizhia front, with cluster munitions on July 11th, although the Institute for the Study of War could not independently verify this. As of July 15th, the front line in Zaporizhia extends from the Dnieper around Kamyansk to Novopil opposite Lyubmivka. All of these sectors could prove enticing targets for cluster bomb attacks, because a breakthrough in Zaporizhia Oblast would put Ukraine in position to cut the Russian land bridge to Crimea. It is a highly strategic area. Ukraine will want to affect that breakthrough any way it can, and the Russian defenses there are heavier than anywhere else on the front. This is part of why Ukraine has made such slow progress in the counteroffensive so far. If there is one area where we can probably bet to see the use of cluster bombs at the front, it would be there in Zaporizhia. Ukrainian forces may also wish to use the cluster bombs in Bakhmut, which has seen the heaviest fighting in the war, and which is another axis of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Ukraine is currently pushing towards Minkivka in the north and towards Ozaryanivka in the south. The Ukrainian units there hope to encircle Russian-occupied Bakhmut and cut the city off from supply lines further to the east. Finally, the Ukrainian military may seek to use its new cluster bombs to support special operations across the Dnieper River opposite Kherson. In deploying its new weapons, Ukraine could use them to disrupt Russian formations over a wider area than its current artillery shells do. Still, Ukraine would need to be careful that unexploded bomblets do not become de facto landmines that impede the movement of its own forces. On the other hand, the unexploded bomblets dropped on Russian lines could also protect the gains that Ukraine makes in its attacks. The area denial factor of these unexploded bombs then works against the Russians, making it harder for them to counterattack. In this way, it's possible to view the tendency toward a high dud rate as a feature of cluster bombs, rather than a bug. Cluster bombs dropped on strategic pieces of real estate like airports, approaches to river crossings, tactically important high ground and so on, act as improvised, rapidly deliverable landmines that slow down the operations of enemy forces. 
Every piece of ground Ukraine retakes could be protected with the unexploded bomblets of the cluster weapons it uses on Russian lines. Areas where Ukraine would more likely not want to deploy cluster bombs would be in sectors with even marginal civilian populations. Indeed, one of the terms of the deal that Ukraine made with the Biden administration was an assurance that the American-made cluster bombs would not be used in areas near where civilians are present. This could mean that the artillery batteries equipped with the cluster rounds are less likely to fire near occupied villages, but in the zones between them. All wars are first and foremost political, and large numbers of civilian casualties that come as a result of Ukrainian-deployed cluster bombs would risk undermining the global support that Ukraine has managed to build since Russia's invasion. One of the many reasons why Russia has been condemned for its conduct in the conflict is through its own use of cluster bombs. In early March 2022, human rights groups accused Russia of using cluster bombs in civilian areas. One such attack wound up hitting a school in Kharkiv, the second biggest city in Ukraine. The attack killed three civilians, including a child. Although Russia has not ratified the Convention on Cluster Munitions, the attack was still considered a war crime. The move was similar to some of Russia's accused tactics in the Syrian civil war, where cluster bombs were also used, including against civilian targets. In July 2022, Amnesty International came out with a more detailed report, accusing Russia of killing hundreds of civilians in the Kharkiv area through indiscriminate shelling and the use of cluster bombs. The weapons in question were the 9N210 and the 9N235 cluster bombs and scatterable mines that eject from smaller rockets. These mines explode at timed intervals once released. Investigators from Amnesty International looked at 41 strike sites in Kharkiv that resulted in the deaths of 62 civilians and the wounding of 196 more. They said that using these weapons is tantamount to deliberately targeting civilians. This is a violation of international humanitarian law, despite Russia's not being a party to the Convention on Cluster Munitions. Russia's use of cluster bombs in Ukraine goes much further than the strikes in Kharkiv. Regions all over Ukraine have been targeted with these weapons. Russia has never denied using cluster bombs and has been rather keen to point out NATO's use of its own cluster bombs in the Balkans in 1999. Russia has been a fierce critic of the Convention on Cluster Munitions, saying that these munitions are legitimate weapons which have not been banned by international humanitarian law and play a significant role in the defense interests of Russia. It is in incidents such as these that Ukraine's desire for cluster bombs becomes more understandable. If Russia has already used cluster bombs, Ukraine naturally would see no problem with retaliating in a similar way. Despite the history of Russian cluster bomb use, Sergei Shoigu, Russia's Minister of Defense, threatened escalation, saying that Russian would use similar weapons if American cluster bombs wound up being used in the war. Ukraine, for its part, had also used cluster bombs prior to the Biden administration's decision to deliver more of them to the conflict. As early as 2014, Ukraine was using the Soviet-era cluster bombs it had inherited in the Donbass region against pro-Russian separatist forces, although Ukraine denied that it was doing so back then. The new American-made cluster bombs should be a much better performing round than Ukraine's previous stockpiles. General Zaluzny had been very keen on getting his hands on the DPICM. In his September 2022 interview, he stated that it is a much more effective round than the high-explosive artillery shells the United States had been delivering to Ukraine. Unlike cluster ammunition, high-explosive shells hit a single point and explode. Although these impacts create shockwaves and thousands of high-speed shell fragments, the area of effect is much smaller than a cluster bomb. Although the United States has granted Ukraine DPICM artillery rounds, it has not yet granted the Mark 20 Rock I-2 or the Mark 118 bomblets that it drops. We will need to see if that changes. The Biden administration is probably hoping that it will not need to provide these weapons and risk further alienating international allies and partners. If the DPICM artillery rounds make enough of a difference in the counteroffensive, then there is less of a need to send more cluster bombs to Ukraine and contaminate the country with the duds. That is an important consideration for Ukraine's prospects both during and after the war. Although examples of Russian cluster bomb use in the current conflict abound, the Ukrainians will need to take heed of the example Russia has set. The first delivery of American cluster bombs to Ukraine was confirmed by the Pentagon on July 13. We must now wait and see how Ukraine exactly will use them on the battlefield and where it will do so. The answers will come shortly. Ukraine's new cluster bombs should prove more effective than the Soviet-era munitions it had been using. But more than any other weapon granted to Ukraine so far in the war, 
This type of munition divides Western opinion. Since securing Western support for the duration of its war with Russia remains the most important item on the strategic agenda for Ukraine, it will need to be more careful with how it uses cluster bombs than any other weapon in its arsenal. If it uses them in a reckless or less than discriminate way, it will risk undermining the Western support so vital for its war effort. The negative response of so many NATO allies to the news of the Biden administration's decision will undoubtedly provoke caution in the Ukrainian high command about how these weapons should be deployed. But what do you think? Is it a good idea to give Ukraine cluster bombs? Where would the Ukrainians use them in their offensive operations and how? Do you think they could change the course of the war? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. The US recently announced the next generation of Abrams tank. How would it fare in an out-and-out -out tank duel with Russia's best? A remote 30mm chain gun, 360-degree panoramic daytime, thermal and laser targeting, smaller crew, modular upgradability, next-generation digital sensors, AI and drone pairing capabilities, parallel diesel and electric power modes, a lethal main gun. Welcome to the Abrams X. After decades of incremental improvements, the 40-year-old battle-proven M1A2 Abrams main battle tank MBT is finally set to receive a comprehensive next-generation overhaul. Last October, General Dynamics Land Systems previewed its concept for the Abrams X. In a demonstration featuring a full-scale mock-up laced with futuristic upgrades and design improvements, the new Abrams X offered a glimpse into the future of tank technology. In today's video, we'll see what the newly designed Abrams X improves upon and how it might fare in an out-and-out -out tank duel against Russia's best offering, the T-14 Armata. American tank technology did not change much during the Cold War. After World War II, the American military relied heavily on its first-generation main battle tanks, the M48 Patton and its successor, the M60. Both saw heavy service either in NATO or Vietnam. However, by the 1970s, progressive Soviet tank improvements had prompted Western militaries to revisit their decades-old tank design. In the 1960s, the US and West Germany began collaborating on a replacement main battle tank expressly designed to defeat the Soviet T-62. By 1970, their joint project, the MBT-70, had incorporated the latest weapon, engine, and suspension technologies, but the resulting platform was far too heavy and expensive to produce as a whole. The project was eventually scrapped, prompting the US Army to reallocate its remaining funding to develop a viable alternative. This they did. Throughout the 1970s, Chrysler Defense won its competition with General Motors for its M1 prototype, a design that was soon awarded a $20 billion development contract from the Department of Defense. In 1979, the M1 Abrams began rolling off production lines, a revolutionary design with sleek armor, improved targeting, and better cross-country travel capabilities than anything else in its class. General Dynamics purchased Chrysler Defense in the mid-1970s and has continued production of the M1 Abrams to the present day. Costing well over $6 million per unit, over the span of 40 years, General Dynamics has produced more than 10,000 Abrams tanks. Remaining in service for decades after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the Abrams Abrams racked up an impressive combat record in the Persian Gulf War and subsequent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Admittedly, since the Abrams has never engaged in a tank duel with a vehicle of similar specifications, it's hard to know how it might perform in a fair fight. During the 1991 Gulf War, American M1s destroyed 37 Soviet T-72s, the best enemy tank at the time, while sustaining zero casualties. It had a comparable, though slightly less, lopsided service record in Iraq. Throughout these conflicts, the Abrams played to its primary strengths, especially its impressive firing range and durability. Able to engage enemy vehicles at more than 2,500 meters, its frontal armor could survive direct armor-piercing rounds fired from other Abrams tanks, while its depleted uranium and British-designed composite ceramic Cobham armor covering the rest of the vehicle kept four-person crews safe from harm. In the 1990s and 2000s, General Dynamics began producing an upgraded version of the Abrams, the M1A2, a system which made full use of the latest technologies. The M1A2 added thermal night vision imaging capabilities, integrated digital displays with better maps and communications, inter-vehicle information systems, improved cooling, and an overhauled transmission. 
Starting last year, 2021, the US Army finally began retiring the M1A1 Abrams from service. While the M1A1 is set to become a relic of a bygone era, the US military anticipates keeping its successor, the M1A2, in the ranks until well past 2050. A remarkable testament to the resilience and modularity of the Abrams' main battle tank design. But wait, if upgraded M1A1 2 Abrams are forecasted to remain in service for at least three more decades, why announce the Abrams X? Well, as the popular song goes, the times, they are a-changing. With the pace of technological change now moving faster than ever, militaries are beginning to unveil the next generation of smart tanks, ones that shoot, move, and communicate on a different plane than their predecessors. The Abrams X is still firmly riding the future war hype train, so we shouldn't get too carried away envisioning its potential role in the American Army of the future. The demonstrator version that debuted on the show floor last October looks like it will capitalize on cutting-edge computer processing, AI, and drone integration technologies, but it will still have to undergo plenty of tests before it's approved for manufacture. Before the Abrams X enters the battlefield, we'll continue to see the current production version of the Abrams tank, the M1A2 System Enhancement Package SEP version 3, and its successor currently in development, the M1A2 SEP version 4, for decades to come. So, when it finally does enter service, where might the Abrams X diverge from its predecessors? Bristling with a full suite of fancy electronic systems, the Abrams X addresses the two biggest complaints leveled at the M1A2, its weight and power. The current Abrams variation weighs in at a whopping 73.6 tons, a number that started at around 60 tons in the first Abrams variant but grew more cumbersome with each successive upgrade. Because of its weight, the Abrams devours an astonishing amount of fuel, 10 gallons just to start the engine, close to 2 gallons per mile, and up to 10 gallons per mile when idling. When you factor in how difficult it is to transport heavy vehicles around the globe and resupply them with that much fuel, shrinking the Abrams logistical footprint seems like a no-brainer. Carving off the excessive weight, the Abrams X comes in at 60 tons, a feat achieved by moving the crew out of the main turret forward in the tank's hull, adding an autoloader for the main gun, and removing the turret's heavy armor. Some tankies might see the loss of a crew member as a possible weakness in the Abrams X. Sure, the autoloader is nice, but having an extra crew member on board can be a blessing, not a curse. Yes, there's less space, but the extra crew members can help operate secondary and tertiary weapon systems, help repair broken parts, fly drones, deploy countermeasures, or, the far more useful benefit, get chow for the others. Just in case the Abrams X autoloader systems do somehow break down, it's nice to have redundancy. On the subject of the autoloader, we know what you're probably thinking. What about all those Russian T 72s and T 80s in Ukraine, whose autoloader turrets give NASA spaceships a run for their money? Don't they just get blown into orbit when they're hit by anti tank missiles? Won't the Abrams X run into similar problems? It's a fair question. General Dynamics claims that it won't. Keeping the Abrams' original ammo storage design, one that relies on a sealed ammunition compartment behind the main turret with blast doors that open only momentarily when loading around, it will avoid the pitfalls of the Russian autoloader variant, which stores their ammo cyclically underneath the turret. With its lighter footprint, the Abrams X draws more from its power plant by replacing the original Abrams turbine engine with a diesel hybrid electric system. Operating in parallel with an advanced Cummings diesel engine, the main power source, a high-powered electric generator provides up to 50% fuel savings over the long run, enabling crews to engage quiet mode on stationary operations without starting the main engine. These batteries also provide a helpful option for exporting power to adjacent units. Apart from these improvements where the Abrams X shines in its upgradability, the Abrams X is fully modular, making use of the Catalyst Next Generation Electronic Architecture NGEA, that relies heavily on AI for target identification and acquisition, land navigation and path planning, and next-generation situational awareness. The three-man crew is surrounded by a digital interface that offers far more visibility than its predecessors. Their vision gets amplified as crews control adjacent UAVs, robotic ground vehicles, and switchblade drones from the comfort of their bucket seat recliners. The NGEA is fully upgradable as new systems are developed, giving Abrams X space to grow into new roles as battlefield technology evolves. The Abrams X boasts even more lethality than current Abrams models. Even though it retains its original 1200mm main gun, it replaces the traditional 50 caliber turret-mounted exterior machine gun with a fully remote 30mm chain gun. In effect, this transforms the Abrams secondary weapon from an anti-personnel, human-fired machine gun into essentially an M1 Bradley in miniature, one capable of engaging soft and lightly armored targets using programmable airburst munitions. This, General Dynamics claim, will serve as a better response to anti-tank teams, while its Trophy Radar-Guided Active Protective System APS, basically a robotic shotgun, can shoot down incoming missiles and drones. 
This all sounds pretty amazing and cutting edge, right? However, while the Abrams X certainly improves many of the drawbacks associated with the M1A1 and A2 versions, it may not be as innovative as it seems. In 2015, the Russian armed forces revealed the T-14 Armata, a highly secretive next-generation main battle tank based on the Armata Universal Combat Platform. The Universal Armata design was originally intended to serve as a starting point for the next generation of Russian heavy infantry fighting vehicles, IFVs, and armored personnel carriers, AFVs. The T-14 tank iteration is capable in its own right. Coming in at a spry 55 tons, it is slightly bigger but also lighter than the M1 Abrams. Powered by a 1,500-horsepower, 12-speed automatic diesel engine, it's slightly faster than the Abrams. Costing $4 to $5 million per unit, it's also cheaper to produce, slightly more maneuverable, and claims to have an operational range of 310 miles. If anything, the T-14 may well prove to be a trendsetter. It was, after all, the world's first production tank with an unmanned turret, a design feature the Abrams X will replicate. It possesses a larger 125mm smoothbore cannon, an autoloader, reactive armor, and an active protective system APS similar to the one on the Abrams X. Like the Abrams X, the Armata's three-man crew store their rounds in a sealed turret compartment, separate from the cockpit. Likewise, the power plant autoloader and cockpits are sealed against nuclear, biological, and fire threats. The T-14 also has a merged engine transmission unit that can be swapped in 30 minutes in the field, and future variants may be equipped with a massive 152mm gun, which can fire guided missiles capable of shattering armor twice as thick as the Abrams. When it was first announced, the T-14 set the Western world into a frenzy. Could the existing M1A2 Abrams variants hold its weight against the latest Russian main battle tank? On paper, at least, it was close. They had similar armament, top speeds, and armor. With its isolated crew compartment, the T-14 may have been able to better protect its operators. It had marginally better range, muzzle energy, fuel efficiency, and maintenance potential. But the robust 40-year-old Abrams design with its modern upgrades would almost certainly hold its own in a firefight which did not bode well for Russia, since by the time they announced the T-14, there were already 10,000 operable Abrams produced and in use around the world. As it turned out, there wasn't much to worry about. Despite plans to acquire 2,300 T-14 tanks by 2025, there are still virtually no Armatas in use throughout the Russian armed forces. As the Armata program was beset by production issues, financial problems, and trial delays, its initial acquisition was scaled back to just 100 experimental vehicles, a number that Russia has fallen well short of reaching. Today, it's unknown just how many Armata tanks are either in production or being tested by the Russian armed forces, with some estimates claiming a mere 20 pre-production units were actually delivered. Can this tank actually be mass-produced, as the Abrams has been? The jury is still out. There are many other unknowns surrounding the project, whether it actually has participated in war games or live fire events, whether the 50-ton tank could actually achieve the same level of survivability as the sturdier Abrams, or whether its autoloader system is as reliable as claimed. With the Abrams X incorporating and surpassing many of the design features introduced by the Armata, it would certainly be favored in a one-on-one -on -one duel. The fact that the existing Abrams is a time-tested, battle-proven main battle tank, a formidable base platform that will be continually improved upon and upgraded through 2050 is a huge mark in its favor. Already capable of matching up against the T-14 Armata, the fact remains that the price of upgrading existing and already manufactured M1A2s with the next generation technology is far cheaper than producing a new T-14, something Russia can't even dream of as the economic and military consequences of its ill-planned invasion of Ukraine mount. So could the Abrams X destroy the Russian T-14 Armata? In the end, the accuracy of rangefinders, high-fidelity sensors, and computer targeting would most likely determine the outcome of this tank duel. As one commentator noted, small differences in lethality will likely matter less if one tank is able to see the other, while the other cannot detect at similar ranges. The tank that can find, target, and hit the other one from longer range is likely to prevail in any kind of war engagement. The true difference maker, however, in a fight between the Abrams X and the T-14 Armata would likely not be the tank's technology, armament, or munitions, but in the quality of the crew. This is where the Abrams X, or any modern Abrams model for that matter would truly shine. Operated by competent, well-trained crews with effective NCOs, something the Russians no longer have, tanks are only as good as the humans inside of them. With a strong emphasis on combined and joint operations, American tank crews would almost certainly benefit from air superiority, better intelligence, and integration with remote assets, not to mention far greater interoperability with their global allies and partners.
These all matter on the modern battlefield and will continue to matter in the future. Where these factors fail, discipline, cohesion and training will take care of the rest. In a notable point-blank tank skirmish during the invasion of Iraq, American tank crews in M1 Abrams tanks destroyed seven Iraqi T-72s at a distance of less than 50 yards. Having never fired live ammunition in their training due to the economic sanctions in effect, something the Russian Mobix might relate to today, the Iraqis did not even register a single hit on their American counterparts. Yes, training, drill and cohesion matter a great deal indeed. Until both next-generation tanks actually enter the production line, something that for Russia may not happen at all, as recent reports indicate it has halted its 20 trillion ruble program altogether, one-on-one -on -one showdowns between the Abrams X and the T-14 Armata will likely remain confined to our imagination. But if you had to pick one, who would you go with? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Ever thought of strapping a helicopter rocket launcher to the back of a Mitsubishi truck? Well, as you can see here, Ukrainian fighters have. There is no escape from Ukrainian weaponized civilian Mad Max vehicles. But if you see something like this Soviet-era Volga sedan mounted with a remote-controlled 14.5mm heavy machine gun rampaging your way, you should definitely at least give it a shot. And if you think these trucks are strange, wait till we show you what this 1940 SVT-40 Soviet semi-automatic battle rifle can do. Don't be fooled by its vintage look. This gun is far from being ready to be retired. The Russo-Ukraine war has definitely been producing some of the weirdest weapons we've seen fielded in recent history, maybe even ever. But how weird can it get? Join us as we dive into this rabbit hole and reveal the good, the bad, and the downright strange weapons seeing use in Ukraine, starting with oldies but goodies. It's a common misconception that the newest weapons are the best in modern warfare. Futuristic weapons sporting next-generation designs and big capability promises tend to attract the most public attention, but the war in Ukraine has proven that it's the workhorses, the time-tested OGs, that actually get the job done. In Russia and Ukraine's case, Soviet-era weapons have dominated the battlefield primarily by virtue of their sheer availability and ease of use. This doesn't mean they aren't good. Ukraine's Soviet-era defenses like the S-300 and Buk M1 here, for example, seem to have done an excellent job blunting Russian firepower. The AK-74 and all its variants, such as the AK-74M, are excellent infantry firearms. Ukraine's well-maintained and updated T-72 and T-64 tanks, designs now well over 50 years old, continue to hold their own against Russia's newer iterations, or at least what's left of them. When upgraded with modern electronics and munitions, Soviet-era weapons can more than hold their own in the 21st century. This was the case with the Soviet KH-35 subsonic anti-ship missile that Ukraine overhauled into its R-360 Neptune and used it to sink this jewel of Russia's Black Sea fleet, the Moskva, back in April 2022. There are other examples of Soviet-era weapons being overhauled, upgraded, and flat-out MacGyvered into menacing new packages. Look no further than the trusty RPG-7, the famous Soviet shoulder-fired, muzzle-loaded rocket launcher that has seen service all over the world, for a prime example. RPGs were designed to penetrate tank armor, though their cheap, mass-produced warheads have been used against emplacements, buildings, helicopters, and human targets since the weapon's introduction in 1961. With plenty of cheap RPG rounds at their disposal, Ukraine has adapted certain warheads for more effective anti-personnel use. Video evidence from early in the conflict showed a fearless Ukrainian demolitions expert taking an angle grinder to a live 82mm mortar round, loosening the stabilizer fins with a couple of hatchet blows, and fitting an adapter manufactured by volunteers, all to fit the mortar onto an RPG booster. No mobile mortar system, no problem. All you have to do is strap a rocket booster to a mortar round, like this, and you get a man-portable anti-personnel munition that can be fired from a 15-pound tube. Ingenuity at its best. If this shoulder-fired RPG mortar hybrid didn't get the job done, why not just strap a bunch of anti-personnel grenades in a radial pattern around the anti-tank warhead itself? Well, that was exactly the line of thinking for some Ukrainian frontline units hoping to add a bit more juice to their anti-infantry RPG lineup. Images of makeshift explosives surfaced online revealing just that, an RPG warhead with a half dozen grenades fastened to it, a Frankenstein creation tailor-made for omnidirectional destruction. If the humble RPG is any indication, there are classics in use that are still very functional. 
and then there are classic throwbacks that are real head scratches. With the 75th anniversary celebrations unfolding around the globe, many weapons that played starring roles in World War II have been making their greatest hits comeback in Ukraine. Here are some of the most notable sightings. The Mosin Nagant M1891-30 and its successor, the SVT-40. Back in the heady days of 1891, well over 100 years ago, Captain Sergei Mosin chambered a 7.62x54mm R cartridge into his finalized bolt-action assembly after a decade of experimentation and pulled the trigger of a firearm that would ultimately become one of the most mass-produced military bolt-action rifles in history. 37 million Mosin rifles were built over the next eight decades, as the rifle saw service in 42 separate conflicts, a remarkable testament to its durability, reliability, and versatility. As you might have guessed, the Russo-Ukrainian War is the latest conflict to feature the time-worn Mosin. Updated in 1930, long and carbine versions of the M1891-30 model, the self-same workhorse that helped deliver the Allied victory in the East during World War II, has been seen in service today with Ukrainian and Russian forces alike. Dating back to 2014, Ukrainian separatists in the Donbass regularly utilized the Mosin in sniper roles. Some were doled out to Russian conscripts from deep Soviet stocks after Putin's military mobilization last year. Several of the Mosin's eventual successors, the semi-automatic SVT-40, SKS and the infamous AK-47, have also been seen in use. But this is just the beginning. The water-cooled M1910 Maxim machine gun. One of the strangest sightings in Ukraine actually predates the antiquated Mosin, if you can believe that. Somewhere, someplace, American inventor Hiram Maxim must have been looking on with an amused smile on his face when the armed forces of Ukraine wheeled his revolutionary M1910 Maxim machine gun out of storage. Yes, that Maxim gun, the world's first reliable, effective, mass-produced machine gun, and started using them back in the mid-2010s against the Russians in the Donbass. The Maxim was invented in 1884 and remained in production until 1945, widely adopted around the globe by imperial powers hell-bent on killing each other in two world wars and a host of other conflicts. The Soviets adopted it in 1930, and as the Soviet surplus often did, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, 35,000 Maxims found their way into Ukrainian storage. Many of them were dusted off, mounted onto vehicles, placed at checkpoints and fortifications, and used in other ways to repel the Russian invaders. Sporting protective armor plates and two heavy wheels to add mobility and stability, the Maxim uses the same 7.62x54mm ammunition as many other Soviet machine guns. Capable of firing 600 rounds a minute up to 3,000 meters away, the heavy Maxim is certainly not the best machine gun option on the battlefield, but this great war-killing machine is still showing its effectiveness 131 years later. Old Man Maxim would be proud. Other vestiges of the past have surfaced too. Back in 1947, the Soviet Union produced its last PPSH-41, a workhorse submachine gun used by the millions during World War II. With its recognizable drum magazine and high rate of fire, the open bolt burp gun fired 7.62 by 25mm pistol rounds and saw use after World War II in Korea and Vietnam. Certain photos showed PPSH-41s and the PPS-43, its stamped steel brother in the hands of certain Ukrainian DNR separatist fighters and internal police units in the war's first few months, perhaps more a sign of desperation than utility. It wasn't the only World War II-era machine gun to feature, though. The unmistakable DPM, DP-27 and 28, the mainstay Red Army light machine gun by 1945, have also been seen with their traditional pan, circular top-loaded machine gun chambered for the 7.62x54mm R cartridge. The DPM was eventually replaced by the more robust PK series of light machine guns that are seen around the world. But lead is lead, and clearly the dusty DPM can still hold its own from time to time. We're not sure how many of these are actually in use, but they are certainly there. Speaking of chunky, relatively unwieldy Soviet-designed firearms that refuse to die, Ukrainian soldiers have been seen firing 80-plus-year-old PTRS-41 and PTRD-41 anti-tank rifles from covert positions. These bulky metal rifles were designed from 1938 to 1939 and produced throughout World War II as a stopgap to help Soviet infantrymen stand a chance against German lightly armored vehicles. The gun was essentially an SKS on steroids. For such a relatively cheap weapon, the weapon's 145 by 114 mm armor-piercing cartridges certainly did the job, penetrating armor plates up to 40 mm thick from 100 meters away. 
reportedly used off and on by militiamen in the Donbass firing World War II vintage ammunition since 2014, they are still seen on social media from time to time. There are a few honorable mentions on our list, firearms spotted on the battlefield as old as the ones we've already spoken about, but whose actual use can't be confirmed. These include several Nazi weapons including the MP40 and STG-44 submachine gun, as well as the MG-42, the lead-spitting beast whose modern variant, the MG-3, remains in use in more than 40 countries. Ironically, while certain Ukrainian units used a Nazi-designed machine gun to repel Russian soldiers, early photos from the war showed American-built Lend-Lease Thompson submachine guns taken from captured Russian prisoners. It's impossible to know if this was a one-off sighting, but its presence makes odd sense, considering the United States shipped millions of Tommy guns to the Soviets, then fighting the Nazis back during World War II. Adding more American flavor to the hodgepodge of vintage firearms in Ukraine, if Russian state media is to be believed, the Ukrainians have been using US-made M101 towed howitzers firing 105mm shells on front lines near Zaporizhia, an artillery piece fielded by the US Army during World War II. These M101s were allegedly donated by Lithuania back in September 2022. What about imported flavors? 32 nations from tiny North Macedonia to Slovakia, Slovenia, Spain, and Sweden have all pledged varying amounts of military aid to Ukraine since the start of the war. Some countries, like the United States, can offer tens of billions of dollars worth of expensive vehicles, drones, munitions, and equipment. Others, like Portugal, donate grenades, small arms ammunition, some automatic rifles, and firefighting helicopters. That Ukraine has taken this jumbled admixture of arms and equipment and made it work speaks to their pluck and resourcefulness, traits the Western world has come to admire. In this deluge of aid, a long list of modern small arms have flowed into the country. Ukraine is unique in the annals of military history in that respect. An independent country whose rapidly revitalized military operates with such a vast range of amalgamated systems and platforms. Across the front lines, soldiers are now fighting with M4 carbines, M240s, M32 grenade launchers, and M2 Brownings, alongside smaller numbers of submachine guns donated by private American companies. Desert Tech sent its Bullpup SRS A1 anti-material rifle, an insanely accurate rifle that fires the powerful .338 Lapua Magnum round, while Keltec sent 400 sub-2009 mm machine guns to make up for a civilian contract they'd lost track of. There's even been a sighting of a suppressed American Barrett 50 caliber sniper rifle. To this list, the Ukrainians employ many foreign imports. Czech firearms like the CZ-805 Bren and the ZVI Falcon Op-99 anti-material rifle, British Starstreak laser-guided high-velocity air defense systems, futuristic-looking Belgian FN-2000s, German MP5s, and licensed versions of Israeli small arms like the Tavor and Negev manufactured by Fort, a Ukrainian firm based out of Vinitsia. We've also seen next-generation variants of time-tested designs surface like the Bullpup ASH 12.7 and the Russian-made assault rifle or the AK-12, a fifth-generation Kalashnikov assault rifle introduced in just 2018. Unlike the AK-74, the AK-12 is chambered in the 5.45 by 39mm round, with the Russian variant capable of firing the 7.62, known as the AK-15. With its free-floating barrel, cheaper cost per unit, and stronger construction, the AK-12 features improved accuracy and resilience. Okay, let's get to the juicy stuff. The ripest field for weird weapons during the Ukraine war hasn't really been in a field at all. It's been in the air, where unmanned drones and cruise missiles rule the skies and deliver pinpoint destruction at the push of a joystick. Recently, a Russian blackjack strategic bomber fired a KH-55 cruise missile stripped of its nuclear warhead at Ukraine. Yes, you heard that right. They fired a nuclear-capable cruise missile albeit an older one designed in the 1980s, with weighted ballast in place of its nuclear warhead. But why? The KH-55 cruise missile was first designed in the mid-1970s. Fired from the belly of a Tupolev Tu-160 Blackjack supersonic bomber, the turbofan 200 kiloton yield cruise missiles were the spear of Russia's nuclear deterrent for decades. It may seem strange, but firing an inert nuclear cruise missile makes some sense. Increasingly, as Ukrainian air defenses improve, Russia has seen less success bombarding civilian infrastructure. Cruise missiles are expensive, and Russia seems to be running out. Using older air-launched KH-55 missiles plucked out of storage might be Russia's way of trying to overwhelm Ukraine's air defenses without wasting money on expensive missiles that get intercepted or miss their mark. 
Russia has tried to overwhelm Ukraine's air defenses in other ways too. Back in March 2022, Ukraine released photos of a partially destroyed mystery munition, resembling a dart released from an Iskander M short-range ballistic missile. The strange devices were each a foot long, painted with an orange tail, and contained a heat source but no explosive warhead. The findings were puzzling. Experts believe the darts to be bomblets on part of some sort of cluster munition package. Later, they revised their thesis arguing these dart-like munitions were some sort of penetration aid, a Cold War-era device used as a countermeasure to help primary ballistic missiles reach their target. The darts worked as decoys, like the KH-55 cruise missile mentioned earlier. Loaded up with electronic jammers and heat sources, they can attract missiles, full radars, and foil infrared seekers. Jeffrey Lewis, professor at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey, California, claimed it was a very curious decision by the Russians to use decoy missiles, considering that at that stage Ukraine still lacked the military capabilities to successfully shoot down Iskander missiles. These penetration aids were highly classified for decades, making their subsequent discovery an intelligence bonanza for the West. Another mysterious impact crater, this one far from Ukraine in the Croatian capital of Zagreb, made the world wonder what on earth the Russian military was up to one month into its invasion. On March 10, 2022, an unmanned aerial vehicle overflew Romanian, Hungarian and Croatian airspace, flying 430 miles per hour at 4,300 feet before careering into a Croatian school campus and crashing into soft ground. The local residents were fortunate the drone landed just 160 feet from a highly populated student dormitory. Incredibly, nobody was hurt. Initial theories claimed it had been a Ukrainian army recon drone. Inspections of the surviving wreckage painted a different picture. The presence of Cyrillic markings and a Soviet Red Star insignia prompted an American analyst to identify the aircraft as a Russian Tupolev Tu-141 drone, an unmanned aircraft used since the 1970s. Subsequent investigations revealed that the drone was indeed carrying a warhead. Nobody ever found out whether it had been a Russian drone or was in fact an off-course Ukrainian drone that ran out of fuel. Either way, the crash sparked an international incident, with residents and politicians from several NATO countries wondering how such a drone could so effortlessly penetrate their airspace. But the drone story doesn't end there. Russia has employed plenty of drones to observe and attack Ukrainian civilian and military targets. One of the most unique iterations has been the Zala KUB BLA Kamikaze drone, a short-range loitering munition manufactured by a subsidiary of the Kalashnikov company. The KUB BLA, measured with a wingspan of 1.2 meters, can carry a 3 kilogram payload and travel 130 kilometers per hour. It has a maximum range of 40 kilometers and a flight time of 30 minutes, so it can't be employed far beyond Russian positions, but it can make use of AI technologies on approach, making adjustments and identifying its static target. Several KUB BLA drones were intercepted over Kyiv in the early days of the invasion, sparking theories that they were being used to target Ukraine's president Volodymyr Zelensky and decapitate the Ukrainian government. Some of the most interesting drone footage captured during the war, however, doesn't come from military drones at all. It comes from the cheap, commercially produced drones that the Ukrainians have jerry-rigged for all manner of missions. Using 3D printers, a soldering iron, cheap hardware, and some plain old-fashioned ingenuity, Ukraine's army of commercial drones have now been retrofitted for offensive service and to great effect. It took lots of experimentation and refinement to engineer a light enough grenade to knock out enemy armor using nothing but altitude and gravity. Very quickly, Ukrainians succeeded in engineering lightweight munitions that did not affect a drone's flight path whatsoever. A real engineering masterclass. War is economy. It's money. One Ukrainian soldier commented on the rationale for making everyday drones more lethal. If you have a drone for $3,000 and a grenade for $200, and you destroy a tank that costs $3 million, that's very interesting. Interesting indeed. Makeshift air-delivered care packages have gone on to achieve global renown, both the deadly and the benign. Viral videos show deft Ukrainian drone operators conducting the wartime equivalent of a basketball trick shot, landing grenades in open tank hatches, underground air pipes, narrow trenches, and populated foxholes from hundreds of feet in the air. In other settings, drone modifications have been shown being used to transport small packages of sugar to frontline soldiers, and even most recently, to steal an enemy radio set from a dead Russian soldier that was subsequently used to listen in on enemy plans for several days. The Ukrainians have thanked their Russian enemy for their default Lend-Lease program. Abandoned and salvaged equipment, most of it virtually interchangeable with what they already carry into battle, provides an ongoing boon to Ukrainian military effectiveness. 
but not all strange and unique weapons are captured intact. While the Ukrainians will make use of the captured firearms and other weapons for a long time to come, vehicle debris recovered after a skirmish almost a year ago revealed a destroyed Russian prototype tank many believed to be one of a kind. Video footage from a March 17, 2022 clash showed the burnt-out remains of a completely unique tank, a T-80 UM-2 Black Eagle. This particular Black Eagle was in bad shape. Like so many before and after it, its autoloader had taken a direct hit, which promptly exploded and blew its turret clean off. It was an interesting find. The T-80 UM-2 was once part of a next-generation tank development project, codenamed Object 640, or Black Eagle. The first iteration of the main battle tank appeared in 1997. At the time, Russia touted the experimental, modified T-80U as something that would easily hold its own against Western main battle tanks like the M1A2 Abrams. It boasted Cactus Explosive Reactive Armor ERA panels on its front hull and track skirts, a welded steel turret, anti-fragmentation screens around the main gun and eventually, DROZD-2 Active Protection System a radar-operated anti-rocket and missile fragmentation defense net that can disable incoming munitions 20 to 30 feet from the tank. Unfortunately and predictably for Russia, the project never got off the ground. The T-80 UM-2 never entered production, and the prototype became a trial platform for new systems until, in early 2022, it was lumped into a Russian military column, ambushed north of Kyiv, and utterly destroyed. Perhaps Russia was keen to test out its capabilities on the modern battlefield. At any rate, one of the only tanks deployed to Russia so far to feature an anti-protection system didn't fare well. Remember that saying, desperate times call for desperate measures? Having now lost over 1,600 confirmed tanks in battle, 536 of them captured outright by Ukraine, Russia's real strategy has been to scrape the bottom of the barrel for dilapidated and poorly maintained Soviet-era surplus in its stocks hastily modernized them and shipped them off into the meat grinder for use by ill-trained conscripts and mercenaries. Recent images on social media, for example, show several BRDM-2MS 4x4 armored reconnaissance vehicles being overhauled at Russia's 103rd armored repair plant near Cheetah in Siberia. However, the BRDM-2MS isn't much to write home about. It's an updated version of the BRDM-2, a Soviet amphibious lightly armored vehicle introduced into service back in 1966. Fitted with a coaxial 7.62 machine gun and a one-man turret with a 14.5mm KPVT machine gun, mechanics were shown outfitting the paint-chipped vehicle with new thermal sights and, hopefully, a new coat of paint. Which again begs the question, why? Given the rate of vehicular destruction in Ukraine, operating the four-man BRDM-2MS will be like riding a tin box into battle against the likes of the modern AT-4, Javelin, or Enlor. Yes, it's nice to have wheels when you're an infantryman, but all the time and energy spent modernizing or perhaps more accurately, restoring a vehicle that will barely stand up to Ukrainian artillery, mines, and tanks, much less the far cheaper Western anti-tank missiles commonly employed across the front just seems counterproductive like Putin's entire war. Yes, it may just be for show. Perhaps it may even excel in a behind-the-lines transport role. Nobody knows just how many BRDMs will see combat. But if they are deployed to the front, one Twitter user observed that Russia's upgrades are tantamount to having an 82 Honda and slapping a backup camera to it. They certainly won't protect their occupants. We do know that the same repair plant has modernized oodles of Cold War antique T-62s of all types the same ones seen on railway cars headed to the front at various stages of the war thus far. Most of these museums on tracks, culled from deep storage, have not seen combat in decades, if at all, and their maintenance records reflect that fact. Most are being fitted with new engines, thermal imaging, bulkier armor, new comms, and better optics. The mere presence of the T-62 in Ukraine, 20,000 of which were being mass-produced during the Cold War from 1961 to 1973, shows how depleted Putin's starting lineup of T-80 and T-72 tanks has become. Attrition has forced him deep into his reserves. The number of T-72s in storage are reported to be far lower than anticipated, many of them mothballed and unsalvageable. T-62s are often used by reserve units in the East and thus kept in better condition. But if they get deployed to the front, no amount of cope cages welded onto the T-62 chassis will be able to protect these relics from destruction. Think of what would happen if all of a sudden the United States Armed Forces started wheeling M60s out of storage and slapping modern equipment onto them. Sure, it could do something, the same way a T-62 can. If deployed to fortify an occupied town or doled out as a training implement, it could provide some utility. But as David Axe, a Forbes defense writer, said it, 
There's no evidence the T-62s played any meaningful role in the fighting. There's ample evidence their four-man crews abandoned the tanks at the first opportunity. The Cheetah plant has allegedly been tasked with refurbishing 800 T-62s by 2025. As you may have noticed, this list of the strangest, weirdest weapons in Ukraine isn't exactly short, and it's hardly exhaustive. Ukrainian soldiers have reportedly captured one Russian prisoner armed with a Chinese-made single-shot pellet rifle. There is also that iconic image of a Russian Roskvadia member guarding a checkpoint in Kherson with an antique 12-pound Napoleonic-era cannon. It could all be a joke, a stunt for social media, or a decoy to fool the Ukrainians. Either way, it's surreal that so many historic and head-scratching pieces have made their way onto the battlefields of Ukraine. Did we miss anything? What's your strange weapon of choice from this list? Let us know in the comments. Putin has been targeting Ukrainian cities and its civilians since the beginning of the Russo-Ukrainian war, and recently it's gotten worse. President Volodymyr Zelensky has been upgrading Ukraine's air defense system as quickly and efficiently as possible. But here's the problem. Air defense is super expensive and supply of ammunition is limited. Thankfully, Ukraine's Western allies are on it. Germany recently announced it would be resupplying Ukraine with 45 Gepard or Cheetah anti-aircraft tanks by the end of the year to aid in its defensive struggle against Putin. These tanks are designed to destroy low-flying targets and are much cheaper to operate than other air defense systems like the US-made Patriot. Will they be able to protect Ukraine's critical infrastructure and civilian targets from Putin's missiles and drones? Ever wondered why Putin is targeting civilians in the first place? Here's the thing. In parallel with Ukraine's growing battlefield dominance, Russia has had a more difficult time attacking Ukrainian military units. One of the few ways that Putin has chosen to fight back has been to launch massive and continual waves of missile and drone attacks at Ukrainian cities. It cannot be understated how villainous these attacks have been. According to the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, OHCHR, estimates, over 9,000 Ukrainian civilians have been killed as of June 2023 and more than 15,000 wounded from these and other Russian attacks. Those numbers, though tragic, are dwarfed by Ukraine's own estimates. They say that the civilian death toll in the invasion so far is closer to 100,000 killed, more than 10 times the official number released by the United Nations. For their part, the UN has admitted that the real numbers of civilian casualties will undoubtedly be higher than what they can confirm. Many of these deaths have come from the thousands of missiles and drones that Russia has used to target Ukrainian civilian targets, both infrastructure such as elements of their electrical grid, as well as apartment buildings, hospitals, shopping areas and schools. As of early July 2023, Brigadier General Oleksiy Romov, Deputy Chief of the General Staff of Ukraine, reported that close to 5,000 missiles have been fired at Ukraine, with almost 3,500 of those strikes carried out on populated areas. To be able to defend themselves from such attacks, Ukraine has received some of the best Western-made surface-to-air missile systems, including at least two batteries of the very capable US-built Patriot missile systems, which have helped protect Ukraine's capital Kyiv from advanced Russian ballistic missiles. A third battery has been promised by the Netherlands, but its arrival is not expected until later in 2023. The challenge of using the Patriot system is in reserving its expensive missiles to shoot down the more advanced and harder-to-target Russian missiles. Ukraine can't use their Patriot batteries to shoot down every missile and drone that Russia launches, and Russia has been relying more and more on the much cheaper, Iranian-made Shahed-136 drone, which costs a fraction of the $4 million per missile that a Patriot battery fires. Estimates are that the Shahed-136 drones currently being deployed by Russia cost as little as $20,000 to make, even using other surface-to-air missiles like Ukraine's Soviet-era S-300 SAM systems and fighter-launched interceptor missiles can cost Ukraine between $140,000 and $500,000 per launch. In just one night, July 7, 2023, Russia launched 18 Shahed drones from the city of Primorsk Aktarsk in the region of Krasnodar Krai. Ukrainian defenses managed to destroy 12 of the drones, but six still got through. Because of the vast numbers and lower costs of some of Russia's attacking drones, Ukraine has had to make use of less expensive systems to shoot down these attackers. One of the best responses to these attacks has been the use of an overlooked piece of military hardware, one that's been discontinued by its original manufacturer as being too out of date for the fast-paced environment of modern warfare. 
but which has still made a huge impact on the Ukrainian battlefield and has been responsible for saving hundreds, if not thousands of lives, the 1960s-era Gepard self-propelled anti-aircraft system from Germany. Let's take a look at why this Cold War-era piece of military hardware was and still is a total badass. Here's how it started. Anticipating a possible war between NATO and the Soviet Union, Germany began development of the Gepard, the German word for cheetah, in the late 1960s based on the hull of the Leopard 1 main battle tank. The initial design requirements were for a mobile anti-aircraft system to counter low-flying Soviet fighter bombers. Drones hadn't even been anticipated back then, but fleets of Soviet ground attack aircraft were definitely considered a threat. Between the beginning of production in 1973 and the late 1980s, when the Gepard was discontinued in favor of more advanced designs, Germany built 420 hulls and about 430 turrets. The Gepard is equipped with a pair of quick-firing Ehrlichon 35mm cannons, which can each fire 550 rounds per minute. Putting a stream of lead like this into the sky has been an effective way of countering the Shahed drones, and their lower overall cost per system, compared to other more expensive SAM systems like the Patriot or S-300, means Ukraine can deploy more and more of them over a wider area of the country, providing air defenses to smaller cities like the recently struck Lviv. One of the reasons the Gepard can defeat these drones is because of their integrated radar systems, which have a reported range of more than 10 miles. Designed to track Soviet-era fighters and bombers, they work even better against the more sluggish Iranian drones. The Gepard can fire a variety of ammunition, including armor-piercing discarding Sabot tracer rounds, high-explosive incendiary tracer rounds, and advanced hit efficiency and destruction rounds. Depending on the ammunition they're firing, Gepard cannons can hit targets more than three and a half miles away. Ukraine began using the first Gepards around August of 2022. They were first reported officially on the Ukrainian Weapons Tracker Twitter account on August 25th, though they may have been in the country earlier and just not officially acknowledged before then. As of June 2023, Germany has sent at least 34 Gepards to Ukraine and has agreed to send another 15 more in the coming weeks. Germany has promised a further 30 Gepards will be delivered before the end of the year. In addition, other countries that have bought Gepards in the past from Germany are in talks to send more of the systems, including Jordan, which operates around 40 Gepards. As soon as the Gepards were in country, they were rushed to the front lines almost immediately and proved effective at downing low-flying Russian cruise missiles and drones. They have been particularly effective against the Shahed 131 and 136 drones that Russia has been using against Ukraine's civilian population and their energy infrastructure. Because of the relative simplicity of the system, Ukrainian crews have been able to successfully operate the Gepard after only two months of training, compared to the German standard of 18 months. One crew around Odessa reportedly downed 10 Shahed drones and two cruise missiles in a single day. Inexpensive and simple-to-operate anti-aircraft systems like the Gepards bridge an important gap in Ukraine's air defenses, which includes long-range systems like the Soviet-era S-300 and Buck surface-to-air missile systems, as well as Western-made systems like NASAMS, a jointly produced mid-range air defense system made by the US firm Raytheon and Norway's Kongsberg Defense and Aerospace, along with the previously mentioned US-built Patriot batteries. Missiles fired by those systems are more advanced, but those advances come at a much higher price, and their construction takes much longer to build. These two constraints mean that the missiles used by these systems are relatively few in number. Those advanced missiles are also Ukraine's main defense against Russia's fast, high-flying fighters and bombers, and their high-tech caliber cruise missile. Ukrainian forces can't afford to use them against every drone and cruise missile. Because Gepards are designed to destroy low-flying targets and the ammunition is much cheaper, they can engage the drones and missiles for which the more expensive systems aren't a good match. There's only one problem with Ukraine's use of the Gepards. The ammunition is made by the gun's manufacturer, the Swiss company Erlikon. But Switzerland, attempting to maintain its neutrality, has so far been reluctant to allow ammunition to be sold to Ukraine. As of May 2023, the Swiss were still blocking a proposed sale of Gepard ammunition by Germany to Ukraine. As the producer of that ammunition, Switzerland has the right to oversee any sales of that ammunition by countries that have bought it from them. But Norway, newly accepted into NATO, has indicated that it might be willing to send some of their ammunition to Ukraine, while Germany has indicated they might be able to create a new production line to create the ammunition inside their country. With Switzerland's permission, 
thus bypassing Switzerland's concerns about their neutrality. More recently, some cracks have begun to appear in Switzerland's icy freeze on supplying lethal aid to Ukraine. In early May 2023, the two houses of the Swiss parliament voted to amend the Military Materials Act to allow the transfer of military equipment to Ukraine in the future. This may allow not just the sale of Gepard ammunition, but the possible transfer of some of Switzerland's German-made Leopard 2 tanks as well. In the meantime, Ukraine's allies have been able to source ammunition from other countries. Germany has reportedly acquired ammunition from a Norwegian supplier, since Germany had itself only around 60,000 shells in the opening months of the invasion. The US has also found a new source of both the Gepards and its ammunition from the country of Jordan. The US paid an intermediary, Global Military Products Incorporated of Tampa, Florida, to purchase some of Jordan's Gepards, which may have originally come from the Netherlands. These behind-the-scenes wheeling and dealing should keep Ukraine well supplied with both the systems and the ammo needed to operate them, at least until either Switzerland relents and allows the sale of the ammo to proceed or when a new manufacturing plant for the ammunition is established outside of Switzerland's borders. Ukrainian data shows that in May 2023, Russia attacked Ukraine with a record monthly total of more than 300 drones, nearly all of them Iranian Shahed-type drones. But by the end of July, that number may be eclipsed, as Russia is ramping up its use of the low-cost attack weapon. On June 2nd, Ukraine managed to shoot down 36 Russian missiles and drones in and around the capital of Kyiv overnight, with two people injured by falling debris from the intercepted weapons. To counter this growing threat, Ukraine is working on more technologically advanced methods to stop them, from jamming their targeting systems to intercepting them with defending drones. To provide an idea of how quickly Ukraine is reacting to the drone threat, there were seven companies able to sell drones to the country's military soon after Russia's invasion began. By July of 2023, that number had risen to 40. And by the end of 2023, the number of Ukrainian companies able to produce military drones, both offensive and defensive, will reach 50. But as promising as these new efforts are, a reliable version of their products may be months or years away. For right now, one of the best options Ukraine has available to it is the Gepard. It's already a low-cost platform, it's been a proven drone defeater, and it's available in good numbers right now. The more Gepards Ukraine can purchase or have donated to them from other countries, the better off their cities and their people will be. So what do you think? Will the Gepards be able to protect from Putin's drones until Ukraine builds up its counteroffensive? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Back in 2020, Putin made some big promises. By big promises, we mean one specific, armor-piercing, rapidly moving, supposedly impenetrable promise. You know what we're talking about, and it starts with a T and ends with a laser-guided missile explosion. The T-14 Armata. Putin vowed to manufacture this alleged Abrams killer, by far the strongest and most technically advanced Russian tank ever designed, in mass quantities. You can't say the guy doesn't dream big, but sometimes dreams turn into nightmares. And that's exactly what happened to the Russian dictator who is now facing an incomprehensible shortage of tanks on the battlefield in Ukraine. And we're not just talking about the T-14, which is more or less ghosting this war completely. The guy is running low on every kind of clanky, antiquated Soviet-era hardware and tanks you can think of. The Russian army is currently trying to fight off the latest and greatest Western tanks and IFVs, including American-made M1 Abrams, German-made Leopard 2s, and British-made Challengers, and they are failing at trying to get any real headway in these battles. Would things be different if Russia had more T-14 Armatas at its disposal? In an epic battle between the T-14 Armata and, say, the German Leopard 2, who would win? Let's lay down the stats and find out. But first, a quick review of the T-14 Armata's complicated backstory, filled with red flags that Putin clearly ignored to his own demise. In 2015, the Russian armed forces revealed the T-14 Armata, a highly secretive next-generation main battle tank based on the Armata Universal Combat Platform. The Universal Armata design was originally intended to serve as a starting point for the next generation of Russian Heavy Infantry Fighting Vehicles IFVs, and Armored Personnel Carriers AFVs. This was a common starting point among the world's strongest militaries in the 1970s and 1980s, but the Russians came to the game late, starting development on the Armata platform in 2009. 
The thought was that if you could build a modular next-generation tracked vehicle platform, you'd be able to slap all manner of mission-specific systems onto it according to the needs and dictates of the intended mission. Yes, you could have a powerful main battle tank, but you'd also have the basis of a fleet of combat engineering vehicles, air defense units, armored personnel carriers, tank support vehicles, and self-propelled artillery, if you wanted, ones that all run on the exact same engine, fuel, and spare parts. Ultimately, if you could pull it off, it would vastly simplify maintenance procedures and decrease production costs. But here's the problem. Mission modularity is touted as the one-stop solution to all your tactical, technological, engineering, and budgetary challenges. But in reality, universal platforms can force designers to limit a system's maximum performance by imposing artificial, fiscal, and technological constraints in the name of efficiency and integration. It's okay when the extent of the modularity is limited to, say, the seats on an aircraft, which can easily be removed to make it a cargo versus a passenger transport. But when you scale it up, swapping turrets on a tank chassis to make it an indirect artillery platform in the spur of a moment, there's little chance a universal system will outperform a counterpart which has been expressly designed for the prescribed combat role. Like the rest of the West, Russia has veered away from making the Armata Universal Combat Platform the darling of its motorized ground forces, mostly because it can't anymore. When it was first announced, the T-14 sent the Western world into a frenzy. Could the existing Western main battle tanks hold their weight against the latest Russian offering? On paper, at least, it was close. They had similar armament, top speeds, and armor. With its isolated crew compartment and automated turret, the T-14 may have been able to better protect its operators. It had marginally better range, muzzle energy, fuel efficiency, and maintenance potential than even the American M1 Abrams. But the robust 40-year-old Abrams and Leopard designs with their modern suite of upgrade packages would almost certainly hold their own in a firefight. Which did not bode well for Russia, since by the time they announced the T-14, there were already 10,000 operable Abrams and more than 3,600 Leopard 2s produced and in use around the world. As it turned out, there wasn't much to worry about. The first batch of 12 Armata tanks was delivered in 2015. Despite plans to ultimately acquire 2,300 T-14 tanks by 2025, there are still virtually no Armatas in use throughout the Russian Armed Forces. As the Armata program was beset by production issues, financial problems, and trial delays, its initial acquisition was scaled back to just 100 experimental vehicles, a number that Russia has fallen well short of reaching. So what's the German Leopard 2's backstory? For one, it had a far more optimal service history since its inception in 1979. It was something of a surprise when the German military started designing the Leopard 2 just a few years after it had come out with the Leopard 1 which had only been in service for about a decade, a very short shelf life for a main battle tank. From the start, the Leopard 1 had been a staple of European defense, with more than 4,700 tanks and 1,741 utility and anti-aircraft variants produced. You can still find upgraded Leopard 1s out there in the wild if you travel to Greece, Turkey, Brazil, or Chile, but by and large, most Leopard-adopting militaries have adopted its more modern counterpart, the third-generation Leopard 2, from Poland to Singapore. Updating the Leopard 1 was a decision made in direct response to improvements in Soviet armor during the later stages of the Cold War. West Germany knew it occupied a strategically vital position on NATO's front lines with the Soviet Union. If the Soviets decided to attack, West Germany needed a competitive main battle tank to resist the threat. Fortunately, they succeeded in developing a tank that far outmatched its Soviet opponents. Ironically, the Leopard 2 began its life as a joint development program with the United States to develop a next-generation MBT. The MBT-70 program that eventually spawned the Leopard couldn't quite meet the requirements of either nation, so the US went off to work on the M1 Abrams while Germany returned to its Leopard 1 and began asking how they could take it to the next level. Under the management of Porsche engineers, the Germans concluded that the new platform could incorporate improved engine transmission upgrades, a coaxial auto cannon, heavier rounds, extendable surveillance cameras, and an independent commander's periscope to improve the crew's situational awareness. While they were there, they decided to beef up the tank's main gun from 105 to the 120mm smoothbore the Leopard retains to this day. The West Germans wanted to see how they were doing so far, so in 1976, they sent a prototype to the US for inspection by American engineers. 
The Leopard was as agile, if not more, than the American prototype Abrams XM1 in development. They found the Leopard 2 and the XM1 were comparable in firepower and mobility, and that even though the Abrams could resist explosive kinetic energy penetration rounds slightly better, Leopard 2 crews were almost twice as well protected. The Leopard's engine was more reliable. It guzzled less gas, and it didn't have as large of a heat signature, even if it was noisier. The Leopard 2 hit the production line shortly after its American audition, having improved on its armor deficiencies. Like any MBT, it has undergone a series of regular systems upgrades that have improved its armor, survivability, firepower, and optics as technology has improved. There were a couple of baseline improvements over previous generations of MBTs that really set the Leopard 2 apart. It had blowout panels on the separator between the turret bustle, with its ready ammunition racks and the crew compartment. It had new thermal night sight systems, digital ballistic computers, improved fire extinguishing systems, improved frontal arc armor arrays, and side skirts that could add new ceramic and composite armor modular plating as required. The latest version of the Leopard is the 2A7, first released in 2014. A consistent string of upgrades have either been implemented or are scheduled to continue improving the platform ever since, which will be discussed in more detail later. Rheinmetall, the manufacturer of the Leopard and Abrams 120mm smoothbore guns, announced in 2015 that it would begin developing a new 130mm variant that would offer a 50% increase in performance in penetration. While Germany has announced the end of the Leopard's service life will likely come around 2030, and Germany and France are already jointly designing its replacement, the main ground combat system, there are more improvements to the Leopard 2A7 in the offing including upgrades to the current L55 Cannon 120mm ammunition, as well as a new digital turret core system, situational awareness system, and an active protective system. The T-14 tank is capable in its own right. Coming in at a spry 55 tons, it is 12 tons lighter than the 67-ton Leopard 2. Powered by a turbocharged 1500-horsepower 12-speed automatic diesel engine, the T-14 is actually significantly faster on the road than the Leopard capable of traveling 56 miles an hour to the Leopard's 43. Costing four to five million dollars per unit, the Russian offering is also much cheaper to produce, almost half the cost of the Leopard. It is slightly more maneuverable, has adjustable suspension, and claims to have an operational range of 310 miles, 30 more than the Leopard's 280. If anything, the T-14 may well prove to be a trendsetter. It was, after all, the world's first production tank with an unmanned turret, a design feature the latest generation prototype American Abrams X will replicate. It possesses a larger 125mm smoothbore cannon, an autoloader, reactive armor, and the Afghanit Active Protective System APS, that helps it mitigate the impact of ATGMs that have absolutely eviscerated thousands of T-90s, T-80s, and T-72s that used to form the backbone of the Russian army. The Armata's three-man crew store their rounds in a sealed turret compartment separate from the cockpit. Likewise, the power plant, autoloader, and cockpits are sealed against nuclear, biological, and fire threats, something the Leopard's crew can also boast. Something unique about the T-14 is that it has a merged engine transmission unit that can be swapped in 30 minutes in the field and, in future variants, may be equipped with a massive 152mm gun which can fire guided missiles capable of shattering armor twice as thick as the Leopard's. But speaking of unique features, the Leopard has a few tricks up its own turret. Modern combined operations are undertaken across a variety of terrains and geographic features, waterways and rivers among them. The interior of the Leopard 2 can be sealed, waterproofed, and equipped with a snorkel enabling the vehicle to traverse bodies of water taller than the tank itself. If it needs to, the crew can have up to 12 hours of life support in this sealed configuration, giving its occupants ample protection against the worst chemical and nuclear threats it might encounter on the battlefield. If the temperature rises above 180 degrees, automatic firefighting systems will engage to put the fire out. In terms of armor protection, defense estimates figure that the Leopard 2 had the equivalent protection of 1,840 to 2,920 mm of armor against kinetic energy projectiles, and 2,700 to 4,370 mm of armor protection against chemical explosive rounds. The Leopard 2A6 went even farther, 
improving the crew survivability with protection equivalents of 5,890mm to 7,800mm of armor versus kinetic penetrators, and 9,000 to 11,500mm of armor versus chemical explosive rounds. Leopard crews can feel safe driving over a variety of IEDs and mines with robust belly armor. Spore liners inside the hull prevent the deadly fracturing of internal armor plates when an explosive projectile hits the external armor but does not penetrate it, something that can actually incapacitate or kill a crew without leaving much of a visible trace on the exterior of the vehicle. The Leopard 2 can fire several different types of rounds. The German DM-33 discarding Sabot anti-tank round would be one of the most common in a head-to-head -head matchup, capable of penetrating 960 mm of steel armor at a range of 2,000 meters. The Leopard 2A7's new L55 cannon barrel is longer than its predecessor, giving ammunition improved penetrating power. The German tank can fire Leihat anti-tank guided missiles up to 3.6 miles away through the main gun, something the Armata allegedly claims it can do up to a distance of 5 miles, which could be the deciding factor in a one-on-one -on -one tank duel. In terms of capacity, the Leopard houses 42 rounds inside the crude turret, 15 additional rounds on the left side of the turret bustle, and 27 stored rounds in a specially protected hull magazine. The Armata, for its part, can hold 45 rounds. Both tanks have an array of 12.7 and 7.62mm machine guns in addition to their main guns for suppressive fire against infantry and smaller mechanized targets. Next generation sensors and optics are the norm in both models, but this is where the proven Leopard shines. It has a stabilized optical periscope for day and night operations, one that integrates fiber optic gyros, laser rangefinders, image fusion functioning, daylight cameras, and a thermal imaging device. The Leopard's gunner station incorporates a stabilized main sight and an auxiliary targeting telescope, while the driver can maneuver the tank into position using the tank's built-in night vision and thermal drive systems. If the Armata actually existed, we would find a capable foe. It possesses multispectral sights with laser rangefinders, thermals, and wide-angle cameras offering its crew 360-degree situational awareness. Its automated fire control system uses an advanced battlefield management system to analyze targeting data using the tank's built-in muzzle reference system and range sensors. This would certainly give the crew a leg up, as long as all the systems could be kept in good working order. The T-14's turret uses electrical armament stabilization and can fire programmable ammunition, like the gun-launched anti-tank guided missiles previously noted, expressly designed to destroy tanks and even helicopters. It's also worth noting that the T-14 is networked for guidance with other T-14s. They can be aided by a drone cable attachment that can be used indefinitely to distinguish targets using day or night vision, infrared, and add distance and target guidance data. This means if one tank's drone sees a target, the others will too. The Armata, as you can tell, is a tank purpose-built for the digital age. Good luck killing its crew, too. Its forward-based three-man crew are tightly cocooned in a futuristic steel capsule developed by Russian scientists to be 15% lighter than normal steel, yet withstand insanely heavier blast and heat ratings. Russian engineers wrapped this reinforced steel crew compartment in layers of classified composite ceramic plating. Russian engineers took things a step further. The forward position of the tank boasts a revolutionary Malekit dual explosive reactive armor system that can offset the impact of an RPG or anti-tank round in the front, sides, and top of the tank. In the rear, bar armor adds a few additional inches of potentially life-saving buffer space between the point of impact and the rear armor itself. Like most modern MBTs, the T-14 utilizes an APS system with five rocket launchers on either side of the tank that comes in two versions, hard and soft kill versions. Hard kill systems intercept and disable incoming munitions with projectiles of their own, while soft kill systems interfere with the electronic guidance or stabilization mechanisms of incoming rounds using things like laser dazzlers. The Russian-designed Afghanit system is the first in the world to incorporate both in a single system using millimeter wave radar to target a variety of enemy rounds, including kinetic energy penetrators and tandem charge weapons, like the US-manufactured Javelin. It's not been proven to work 100% of the time, but it's pretty good, analysts believe, at deflecting and destroying artillery shells and unguided rockets that are common on the modern battlefield, and interfering with ATGM guidance systems. 
Some Russians even say it can protect T-14 crews against the depleted uranium kinetic penetrators in common use among American tank crews, but we'll believe that when we see it. Along those lines, there are almost more unknowns than knowns surrounding the T-14 project, like whether it has actually participated in war games or live fire events, whether the 55-ton tank could actually achieve the same level of survivability as the sturdier Leopard, or whether its autoloader system is as reliable as claimed. What we do know is that there is a reason American tank crews rely on good old quality German engineering and precision by adapting the exact same turret and barrel configuration as the Leopard 2. The Leopard 2 systems can keep its gun leveled no matter what terrain it is traversing, even if it's on a hilly terrain or crossing a busy road. After firing, the barrel snaps back to its initial position in the blink of an eye. Hold my beer, T-14, literally. There's a famous promotional video showing a Leopard 2 holding a Stein of German beer on the tip of its turret while it casually launches itself over an obstacle course, and as you might expect, not a drop spills out. As far as we know, the T-14 has more vertical and horizontal recoil, something you don't see on the Leopard, and is slightly less stable than the German model which could delay the target acquisition for its next firing. Ultimately, the Leopard has slightly heavier armor, but the Armata is faster, can travel farther, and is much cheaper to produce. Though apparently not cheap enough for the Russian MOD, it also has an autoloader with a heavier primary gun effective up to 5 kilometers. Using its 3U BK-21 Sprinter ATGMs, that range increases up to 12 kilometers. Both tanks have not, as yet, faced advanced tanks of their same generation in combat. Yes, the T-14 takes a lot of flack. We laugh because the tank broke down in its first public outing at the 2015 Moscow Victory Day Parade. I'm sure Putin would bite your arm off for a mechanically challenged T-14 to parade around these days. He could only drum up a single T-34 for this year's iteration, even though the decision to do so was likely motivated by legitimate security concerns. Still, in a hypothetical one-on-one -on -one battle that blatantly ignores today's geopolitical realities, the fact of the matter is that the Russian tank incorporates and surpasses many of the design features that make the Leopard 2 as great as it is. The armored crew capsule and automated turret offer greater protection and lethality. Its next-generation APS system, high-fidelity sensors, and computer targeting would lend it marked but not decisive advantage. But the fact that the existing Leopard is a time-tested main battle tank of over 40 years with a formidable base platform that will be continually improved upon and upgraded through 2030 is a huge mark in its favor. Only the German government and certain foreign buyers know what kind of next-generation equipment has found its way into the Leopard 2A7+, so it's impossible to know how it would fare in a fight. Already capable of matching up against the T-14 Armata, the fact remains that the price of upgrading existing and already manufactured Leopards with next-generation technology is far cheaper than producing a new T-14, something Russia can't even dream of as the economic and military consequences of its ill-planned invasion of Ukraine mount. In the end, the accuracy of rangefinders, sensors, and targeting computers would most likely determine the outcome of this tank duel. As one commentator noted, Small differences in lethality will likely matter less if one tank is able to see the other, while the other cannot detect at similar ranges. The tank that can find, target, and hit the other from the longer range is likely to prevail in any kind of war engagement. It would be rare to actually find ourselves in a scenario where both tanks are hunting the other. With the ubiquity of drones and aerial surveillance, tank battles a la Kursk have become relics of a bygone era. Even if the T-14 boasts greater reach, with its laser-guided rounds and rate of fire with its automatic loading mechanism, it wouldn't matter as much as we might like to think. Isolated and unsupported as most Russian tanks have been in Ukraine, the T-14 would be an easy and favorable target to Ukrainian infantry, who would just as soon engage it with a far cheaper Javelin or AT-4 than a Leopard of their own. The true difference maker, however, in a fight between the Leopard 2 and the T-14 Armata would likely not be in the tank's technology, armament, or munitions, but in the quality of its crews. And you can take that to the bank. This is where the Leopard, or any modern Western tank for that matter, would truly shine. Operated by competent, well-trained crews with effective NCOs, something the Russians no longer have, tanks are only as good as the humans inside them. With a strong emphasis on combined and joint operations, traditional Leopard tank crews would almost certainly benefit from NATO air superiority, better intelligence, and integration with remote assets and battlefield management internal systems, 
not to mention far greater interoperability with other NATO standard vehicles. Ukraine may lack much air superiority, but it will still be receiving training on how to properly employ them from some of the best instructors in the world. Technology and resilient systems matter on the modern battlefield and will continue to matter in the future, but where these factors fail, discipline, cohesion and training will take care of the rest. Until the Armata actually enters the production line, something that for Russia may never even happen, as recent reports indicate that in the light of recent military setbacks, it has halted its 20 trillion ruble program altogether. One-on-one -on -one showdowns between it and the Leopard 2 will likely remain confined to our imagination. But if you had to pick one, who would you go with? Let us know in the comments. Have you ever seen a real-life death ray? Well, if you haven't seen this clip of Russian troops advancing across a small, cratered field and suddenly getting struck by a powerful explosion, you may have been living under a rock. The video, posted on Twitter by Ukrainian officer Anatoly Stefan, dubbed Destruction of Russians with a Death Ray, went viral, racking up more than 2.5 million views in just days, and it's not surprising. Dubbed a Death Ray because of the thin trail of smoke left in the weapon's wake, the video demonstrated incredible accuracy. As the survivors flee, they are struck by two more shots, leaving only bodies behind on the field. Online, supporters of Ukraine cheered the strike's seemingly mysterious and deadly firepower. But what are we looking at here? What exactly is this death ray? And just how effective could such a weapon be against Putin's forces? Many who viewed the video, including the poster himself, noted that the footage in question most likely shows a Stogner P, a Ukrainian-made anti-tank guided missile system, or ATGM. Military expert David Hambling recently told Newsweek that he in fact believes this weapon to be a Stugner missile, which is often identified by its odd-looking smoke trail and, trust us, it's not referred to as a death ray for nothing. Ukraine's Stugner P missiles were first developed in the 1980s and 90s as a way to boost domestic defense capabilities and have since become a prominent weapon in the Ukrainian military arsenal. In 2021, Ukraine was in possession of over 7,000 Stugners, with many more in production, while a version of the system called the Skiff has also been exported to Turkey and Saudi Arabia, Putin's increasing hostilities created an urgent need for more weapons in Ukraine. As a result, many of the Skiffs being produced for foreign customers were diverted back to Ukraine, leading to videos of Stugners with Arabic characters being used against Russian forces. These missiles are notable and desirable for their versatility, accuracy, and effectiveness against modern armor. This combination of factors, while not exactly a death ray, makes the Stugner P one of the most valuable assets in Ukraine's recent efforts to defend itself against Russian aggression. The Stugner P was developed by the Ukrainian state-owned enterprise Luch Design Bureau, which has a long history of designing and producing high-tech military equipment. The Stugner missile was originally designed to fill the gap in the Ukrainian military's capability to destroy heavily armored targets, such as tanks and fortifications, from a safe distance. The Stugner P missile and launcher weigh over 60 pounds, 27.2 kilos each, and the system usually uses a 17.5, 8 kilo tandem warhead that can penetrate the armor of even the most advanced tanks. Additionally, its guidance system uses a semi-automatic command-to-line-of-sight SACLOS method, which allows the operator to guide the missile to its target using a sight or other sighting device. This remote piloting is a rather unusual feature for a small-sized ATGM like the Stugner. The operator can be up to 50 meters away from the missile, watching the target via remote video link. This video feed is often captured on soldiers' cell phones, one reason why social media is filled with footage of odd-looking strikes like the Death Ray. The ability to be operated remotely also means that soldiers using Stugner missiles are more difficult to retaliate against, which has helped reduce Ukrainian casualties. But that's not even the beginning of how all-around badass this weapon is. While it is heavier and slightly less powerful than the American Stinger or British Javelin missiles, the Stugner P can be launched from a variety of platforms, including by infantry soldiers, light vehicles and helicopters. This versatility has made it an extremely valuable asset for the Ukrainian military, since it can be used in a wide range of scenarios and environments. Early in the war, many of the Stugners were deployed in urban areas, destroying scores of Russian tanks on the roads to Kyiv. With the war's new focus in eastern Ukraine, Stugner missiles have proven valuable in rural off-road settings. This is partly because the missile is also highly effective against other types of armored targets, such as armored personnel carriers and infantry fighting vehicles, which Russia has relied on to supply its invasion force. 
Some Ukrainian troops have even adapted the Stugna missile system to be extra portable by mounting it on the back of fast-moving civilian vehicles or transporting mobile hunter-killer teams, consisting of several soldiers who can rapidly fire their missiles and then retreat before they can be targeted by enemy artillery or drones. The Stugna system consists of a lightweight launch tube and a missile that is fitted with a high-explosive anti-tank or heat warhead. The heat warhead is a tandem round, actually consisting of two parts, a precursor charge and a main charge. The precursor charge is designed to penetrate the outer layer of armor on the target, and the main charge is then detonated to cause significant damage to the target's internal structure. Inside the warhead, the second charge is next to a hollow, metal-lined cone. Upon detonation, the explosive blasts the metal into a narrow, high-speed projectile capable of piercing even the heaviest defenses up to 800 mm. The tandem warhead design is therefore highly effective against almost any modern armor, including reactive armor and composite armor, which are designed specifically to protect against ATGMs. The Stugna P's launch tube is also equipped with a sighting system that allows the operator to accurately engage targets at ranges of up to 3,000 meters. The sighting system incorporates a thermal imaging capability, which provides the operator with the ability to detect and engage targets in low-light and no-light conditions. This has again proven extremely valuable in parts of the eastern Ukraine, where infrastructure and electricity have been knocked out, allowing Ukrainian troops to continue their hit-and-run tactics against Russian artillery and tanks at night. Still not convinced that the Stogna P is one of the fiercest missiles ever invented? No problem, there's more. In addition to its destructive capabilities, the Stogna P has also been praised for its high level of reliability and accuracy. The missile's guidance system is designed to be extremely resistant to electronic countermeasures and jamming, and its relatively compact size and lightweight design don't hinder its accuracy in striking moving targets. Furthermore, the Stugna P's range makes the airborne missile a difficult target for enemy forces to pinpoint, even though the missile is relatively slow-moving compared to some other ATGMs. Its range has made it one of the most effective countermeasures to Russian tanks, by allowing Ukraine to devastate them from hidden off-road positions. Weapon systems like the Stugna are therefore a major reason why Russia has lost more than 1,000 individual tanks since the beginning of the 2022 invasion. In addition to the missile's own targeting capabilities, Ukrainian troops have also showcased uncanny human-guided accuracy in videos like that of the Death Ray. As one Twitter user replied to the post, whoever landed those three shots is, without a doubt, the best ATGM operator on Earth. He's practically sniping with it. The Stugna system is highly effective against a range of non-vehicle targets, including fortifications, buildings, and other structures with tactical importance. And as shown in the video, the system can also be used to engage soft targets such as personnel and unarmored vehicles by swapping out the heat rounds for a high-explosive fragmentation-type warhead. This interchangeability is one of the key reasons why the Stugna P system is a highly versatile and modular weapon one that can be used to engage a wide range of targets in a variety of scenarios. In recent years, the Stugna P has become an increasingly important part of Ukraine's military strategy, as the country has faced more and more aggression from Russia. Despite Western material support, the phase of the war which began with the 2022 invasion has placed a great deal of strain on the Ukrainian military's capabilities, and the Stugna P has proven to be one of the most valuable assets in the defense of Ukrainian territory. The missile's versatility, accuracy, and effectiveness against armor has made it an essential component of the Ukrainian military's effort to protect its citizens and defend its sovereignty. Because of all these factors, the Stugna P missile has become a critical part of Ukraine's military arsenal. And as mentioned, the grinding, ever-changing artillery war in Ukraine's east is an ideal environment for a weapon like the Stugna P, since it can often avoid the punishing retaliations Russia directs against larger missile systems. As the conflict in the East continues, there is little doubt that the Stogna P will likely remain vitally important. Yet questions still remain about whether the weapon captured on video was simply a Stogna P missile or whether there were more elements involved in the attack. There has been some speculation that the strike was not in fact a Stogna, but rather some sort of drone strike. Some have claimed the possibility of a Turkish Bayraktar drone, which Ukraine has received a number of since last year. Others instead argued that the Death Ray is another variant of unmanned vehicle. One former army colonel, who asked not to be named, told Newsweek that the attack may have involved a US-manufactured switchblade drone, a loitering kamikaze munition which dive-bombs a target and destroys itself on impact. Last year, the US committed to sending Ukraine more than 700 switchblades, which are also capable of precision strikes. 
Retired Colonel Mark F. Kantsian of the Center for Strategic and International Studies has stated that the death ray could have either been a Stogna or some form of drone that fires rockets after approaching its target. Either possibility highlights the deadly effectiveness of Ukraine's weapons technology and training, and that while Ukrainians may have been outgunned at the start of the invasion, they aren't anymore. Whatever the death ray may be, videos like this one make it clear that the future of the war in Ukraine will almost certainly revolve around the strategic use of technology. But let us know what you think. Was the video of a Stugna missile, drone, or something else entirely? And just how much has technology leveled the odds? Give us your thoughts in the comment section below and don't forget to like and subscribe for more expert military analysis. Trying to defend yourself in a war against Russia is no joke. In its efforts to defend itself against Putin's aggressive invasion, Ukraine has needed all the help it can get. Here's how a shipment of US Vietnam War weapons could help Ukraine turn the tide against Russia's military. After Russia invaded its smaller neighbor in February, the United States offered to evacuate Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky from the capital. But in an now famous statement of his resolve, Zelensky responded that the fight is here. I need ammunition, not a ride. And soon Western countries were happy to grant his wish. In the months since the war began, the US, NATO and others have supplied Ukraine with an enormous amount of military aid. In fact, the United States alone has contributed over $18.6 billion since February. This has mostly taken the form of lethal modern weaponry, including the High Mobility Artillery Rocket Systems or HIMARS, Javelin Anti-Tank Missiles, self-destructing Phoenix Ghost Drones, and many others. Weapons like these stopped the invasion in its tracks and have helped Ukraine successfully fight back Russian troops all year. As the war transitioned from urban combat to a devastating artillery slugfest in the east of the country, obtaining new firepower has become a major factor in success or defeat. Accordingly, in the past few months, Western assistance to Ukraine has stepped up again. It has started to allow Ukrainian troops to achieve artillery superiority over Russia, driving them out of major cities like Kherson. Ukraine is now firing as many artillery shells as Russia, while satellite-guided targeting is making their strikes longer range and more precise. But modern weaponry isn't the only technology making an appearance on the battlefield. Recently, the US has once again expanded its security assistance to Ukraine. In addition to contemporary weapons, they have made plans to supply Ukraine with upgraded armaments from the era of the Vietnam War. Other NATO countries are expected to follow suit, potentially supplying Ukrainians with a major new source of firepower. While many consider them more fit for a museum, these older weapon systems could still be lethal. They could even help Ukraine counter some of Russia's biggest new threats. But what exactly are these weapons, and how much of an edge will they give Ukraine in the coming months? The main piece of Vietnam-era military hardware currently being delivered to Ukraine are MIM-23 Hawk missile systems. Developed by Raytheon from 1952 onwards, Hawk stands for Homing All the Way Killer, a nod to the missile's guided targeting. A medium to long-range surface-to-air missile, the Hawk was first put into service in 1959. In those days, the US was increasing its involvement in Vietnam, where the Hawk was used extensively. Designed as a more mobile counterpart to the even older MIM-14 Nike Hercules missile, the Hawk emphasized portability over range and altitude. Full of complex components, the original system was also notoriously unreliable and prone to breakdowns. It had a kill shot probability of just over 50% and an average time of only 43 hours between repairs. Because of this, the US military spent decades updating the Hawk missiles, partially through the addition of a semi-active radar homing guidance system. This radar upgrade vastly improved the Hawk's accuracy, and the new model, known as the Improved Hawk or iHawk, entered service in 1971. Over the next 20 years, the iHawk continued to be upgraded with the addition of electronic jamming measures and new warheads for use against short-range targets. These chances increased the iHawk's kill shot percentage to over 85%, making it into a potent weapon. The models being sent to Ukraine are slightly older, but can intercept aerial targets 45 to 50 kilometers, 28 to 31 miles away, at an altitude of 65,000 feet, 20,000 meters. Using solid fuel propellant, the Hawks can reach a maximum speed of Mach 2.4. Each missile is roughly 1,300 pounds, 600 kilograms, and 17 feet, 5.2 meters in length, with a 100 19-pound fragmentation warhead that can deal some serious damage. Hawk missiles are definitely outdated. They were retired by the US Marine Corps in 2002 and replaced by the more powerful Patriot system even earlier. 
The US has so far refused to send Patriot missiles to Ukraine, since doing so would require US soldiers on the ground to operate. Even so, Hawks are a serious upgrade to the Stinger missiles Ukraine has been given so far. While Stingers can be carried by a single soldier, they have far less range and destructive power. In contrast, Hawk missiles are better known for shooting down higher-altitude Russian fighter jets. They can also more effectively counter the Iranian-made Shahed Kamikaze drones, which Russia has been using to wreak havoc on Ukraine's cities. The main advantage of the Shahed drones is that they are cheap and numerous. Russia has reportedly ordered over 2,400 of them from Iran. The drones are fired in groups, so even if most are shot down, a few can usually get through to dive-bomb their unlucky target. Considering Ukraine only has so many surface-to-air missiles, there is a high chance that this keeps happening. And since each Shahed drone costs only $20,000, it's a waste to destroy them with powerful air defenses like the long-range NASAMS missiles, which can cost over $1.2 million per shot. But Hawk missiles could be the perfect solution for countering the threat from kamikaze drones. While not nearly as cheap as Shahed drones, their age does make them inexpensive for missiles, at roughly $250,000 each. And while the US hasn't disclosed how many Hawk missiles it currently has or is sending to Ukraine, there are probably a lot of them. At the peak of their production in the 1980s, the US had over 27,000 Hawk missiles in its inventory. While most of these are less advanced than the later models, they could provide a real boost to Ukrainian firepower. There's just one hitch in this plan, the Hawk launches. The missiles are transported and fired from rolling M192 launchers, which can be wheeled along the ground with three Hawk missiles mounted on the back. The issue? The US might not have any in working condition. Because of their extended time in storage, an American official told Reuters that the country's Hawk launchers are in disrepair. However, one partial solution to this has come from an unlikely source, Spain. The European country announced that it would send four of its own Hawk launchers to the Ukraine to be paired with the refurbished US missiles. Ukraine may also create some homemade solutions, as they've successfully adapted lots of other old-school military technology. The first Hawk missiles will likely be on their way to Ukraine soon, especially since they are being sent through the Presidential Drawdown Authority, or PDA. The PDA is a legal tool allowing the US president to transfer military equipment from storage without congressional approval in emergencies. The Biden administration has already issued the PDA extensively to support Ukraine. Since August 2021, it has ordered 11 drawdowns of military equipment into the country. Congress has been on board as well, increasing the cap of the drawdowns from 100 million to nearly 11 billion dollars for this year. Hawk missiles are just the latest part of this, and despite their age, they could prove to be a valuable piece of military assistance. Ukraine will certainly need all the weaponry it can get hold of, as the conflict doesn't look likely to stop anytime soon, and as it drags on, odd weapons deals like this one could become much more common. Why? Mainly because the war has shaken up the global arms industry, creating sometimes surprising results like the Hawk missiles being sent to Ukraine. It's dramatically increased the demand for weapons by both Russia and Ukraine, but also by surrounding countries worried about more Russian aggression. In another recent example of this, Poland has signed a $5.8 billion defense contract with South Korea, far from one of its usual suppliers of weaponry. The deal includes hundreds of artillery rocket launchers, along with tanks and howitzers that Poland hopes will beef up its deterrence against Russia. And South Korea is just one of a number of countries whose weapons are now in high demand. Iran's choice to begin supplying Russia with drones is also a sign of this, as is Turkey's recent decision to sell similar weapons to Ukraine. Month by month, more countries seem to be getting sucked into the conflict, and since Russia accounts for nearly 20% of the global arms trade, its recent battlefield failures could also cause a steep decline in demand for their products. As this happens, China may also begin to take Russia's place as a major weapons supplier. Many other countries, from India to Bulgaria, are already working to create self-sufficient defense industries in another sign of geopolitical change. Just like the Hawk missiles heading to Ukraine, these unusual decisions are all a product of the massive disruptions caused by nine months of war in Europe. And as weapons continue to flood into the country, more unexpected changes will probably keep coming. But what do you think? Will the Hawk missiles give Ukraine the edge it needs to win the war? Will we see more unusual weapons deals in the coming year? Let us know in the comments below. And if you want more military analysis from the military experts, make sure you subscribe.